the campus and student affairs committee meeting. And uh, before we formally call the roll, I'd like to uh, recognize Dr. Toya Younger as a new member of our committee and, and new member of in, uh, in our staff here. Welcome. Thank you Welcome so much. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I'll go ahead and call the roll for our committee. Regent Least. Here. Um, Vice President Hansen. Here. Uh, Senior Vice President Younger, we know is here. Uh, Vice President Knudsen. Here. Assistant Administrator Cool. Wasn't able to attend for this meeting. Okay. And Jason Pontius, our Associate Chief Academic Officer. Here. Is here. And, and uh, I, uh, Regent Lyndon Meyer is here. First order of business is to approve our minutes from the June 4th meeting. Did uh, everyone have a chance to review those? And are there any changes to those minutes? If I'm hearing none at this point, and if there are none, uh, we will approve those by general consent. Uh, next item of, of business is a report on changes to Title IX regulations. And we have uh, three presenters today. Uh, Lita Gutnick, Leah Gutnick, I'm sorry. Leah, I asked you about it, to pronounce your last name and I mispronounced your first name. <laughs> Uh, Margot Freeman and Monique DiCarlo. Go ahead and, and please begin. Thank you, Regent Lindemeyer, and welcome to everyone this morning. Thank you for inviting us uh, to provide you uh, information about these new Title IX regulations. We can advance to the next slide. There we go. So after wading through the rulemaking process that lasted approximately a year and a half, the new Title IX regulations were issued on May 6, 2020, with an effective date of August 14, 2020. We had roughly 100 days to get everything in order. These new regulations do amend the Code of Federal Regulations and have the force and effect of law where the previous guidance did not. In fact, many of the previous Dear Colleague letters that served as our guidance in years past have now been withdrawn by the current administration. Over the last several years, some jurisdictions throughout the country have also been impacted by case law that offers additional provisions in those particular regions. The new federal regulations emphasize the need for a well-trained team and team members who are free of bias and conflict. The regulations brought us significant changes from the previous guidance. They are quite legalistic, they're very prescriptive, and they are very heavy on due process. They are enforceable by the OCR and they preempt state law. Next slide, please. So this, uh, as I noted, there are significant changes and this slide is just meant to be a demonstration of how long that list of changes really is uh, by just listing some of the topics that are impacted here to give you a, an overview. So for example, the fourth bullet notes emergency removals. This provision speaks to the process that institutions must use if they see a need to remove a respondent student entirely or partially from their education program during the course of the Title IX process. An individualized risk assessment must be completed to determine if the individual is a threat to anyone. And this process is to be overseen by the Title IX coordinator in consultation with other campus officials. Another major change is the way in which our teams will now do evidence reviews. There are several steps in the, in the new processes where we must review evidence, share it with parties, and also determine its relevance. This will be prevalent in the investigation stage and also when the investigator shares a draft of their report with the parties. 
The parties will also have an opportunity to review the evidence and provide comments to the draft report. The decision maker will also take several steps throughout the hearing process to review the evidence and determine relevance. A key part of this process is that the evidence submitted by the parties and or any witnesses during the investigation process will now require that that same individual who supplied the evidence be available for questioning about that evidence at the hearing. If they are not at the hearing, the evidence is not allowed to be used for the purpose of decision making. As I noted earlier, the regulations place an emphasis on a well-trained team. This includes the investigators, the decision makers, the appeal officers, as well as the Title IX coordinators. Schools are now required to post that training that each team member receives, along with the actual content of the training. This information must be accessible on the school websites. Next slide, please. So in terms of the actions that our three institutions have taken, we all worked with one another and with the board office staff throughout the summer to discuss elements of the regulations and how they would be addressed by each of our institutions. We all revised policies and related procedures over the summer. All of our Title, Title IX team members have been trained on the new requirements. All of the institutions have provided opportunities on their campuses for feedback to the revised policies on each campus. And all of us as Title IX coordinators have also been consulting with colleagues across the country. Next slide. So in regard to the impact of these regulations, so specifically UNI has updated our civil rights policy, which is an umbrella policy that had been one policy with one procedure for all civil rights issues. Now we have one policy and two procedures to account for the new regulations. Iowa State University updated their Title IX sexual harassment, sexual assault, leading violence, oh, domestic violence, okay. and stalking policy, as talk. well as their non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. At Iowa, they replaced two separate policies with one new sexual harassment and sexual misconduct policy. They now have the one policy with two procedures to account for the new regulations. And now Margo will talk about what was able to stay the same with these procedures. If you could advance to the next slide. Um, first, I am Margo Foreman, not Margo Freeman. But um, there are some things that didn't change. Um, Sorry. No problem. Okay. So we are, have remained as committed as we were prior to the changes to respond, resolve, and remedy all and provide all the support to all the parties involved as if there were no changes at all. So our commitment has stayed the same at the universities. Um, Title IX still includes sexual assault, domestic violence, and dating violence and stalking as it did before. Although um, the, the, type, the actual description of sexual harassment has been um, somewhat narrowed. Um, the same offices who conducted the investigative processes um, will have remained the same. So we will not be changing the amount of expertise to this process. Despite the narrowing of that definition, the policies continue to address those things that fall outside of the scope of Title IX. And those misconduct um, allegations still will be investigated under other policy um, provisions. And then the ponderance of evidence standard uh, remained the same, where we didn't have um, a quite a, a, a narrowed idea where the evidence um, standard was going to go. Um, there were other choices. We are continue to start stay with the ponderance of evidence. Next slide, please. So there are those differences, and thank you, Leah, for talking about some of those. Um, so. The universities are required to use this formal grievance process for certain types of allegations. So while we do have some provisions that of um, sexual um, misconduct 
that won't fall within Title IX. For those that do, the formal processes have to include the investigation, a live hearing, the question of parties throughout, throughout um, by using an advisor, and a determination by the objective decision maker whether or not that allegation has been substantiated and, and that there are responsible parties to be named. And that's as well as for an appeal process. So during the live hearing, parties don't have to be in the same space. They do have to have the ability to see each other for this cross-examination portion that is now included in the provisions. Complaints must be, <clears throat> complaints must be um, current participants seeking um, in the in programs in our higher education institutions, where before we knew that there could be complainants external to um, the university who may provide evidence or allegations for a respondent that was a student. If a party doesn't have a, hear, a hearing advisor, then universities have the obligation now to provide one for the purpose of asking the questions. We can move forward. Other things that are different is that the statements provided by the parties or witnesses who don't attend, that includes police officers, medical examiners, um, all of those individuals who may be witnesses, they must be excluded and they cannot be relied upon if to make a determination if they're not part of the hearing process. The federal reg regulations require a presumption that the respondent is not responsible until a decision has been rendered by the neutral um, party um, maker. And that's pretty much how the universities ran prior to this um, change in guidance. The regulations have now created options for informal or adaptable resolutions. Um, while that was something that was actually discouraged by the previous administrations and the previous Dear Colleague letters, now we have um, the permission to move forward to try to bring some other alternative resolutions other than um, a full investigation to the, to the process after the investigative pieces started. And I think we're gonna turn this over to Monique. Thank you, Margo. Next slide, please. So we, we wanted to share um, this information with you to, again to illustrate the complexity that the regulations required and the way that those um, that complexity impacts our policies and procedures. So the regulation does require that when the Title IX um, prohibited conduct or jurisdiction requirements are not met, that the school uh, dismiss the charge. And it's a mandatory dismissal. You heard earlier that although the, the regulation provides a narrower definition of sexual harassment, all three schools committed to continue to prohibit a broader definition of sexual harassment and sexual misconduct. So what this means, um, you can see the, the criteria by which a school would have to um, impose or issue the dismissal. And what, what that means is that an aspect of um, an allegation or the the part of the charge that falls under Title IX will be dismissed, we still may be going forward with the investigation to, to determine if other aspects of the sexual harassment and sexual misconduct policy or another policy was violated. And we, we recognize um, how this may be confusing for the parties involved and it's gonna take um, a lot of effort to explain and ensure that people are <coughs> understanding the process as they're involved in it. Next slide, please. The regulation also provides that schools may use a discretionary um, dismissal. And you can see the criteria listed here um, that a university may dismiss the formal complaint or any allegation within the, the, the charge if at any time the complainant requests that the case be closed, if the respondent um, withdraws from school or leaves, leaves employment, or if there is a certain circumstance um, like a death of one of the parties that prevents the institution from gathering evidence um, and moving forward to thoroughly investigate. So all of us um, have had to incorporate the, these step and this requirement within our policies and procedures. Next slide, please. 
So what's next? Um, what's next is that we recognize that the time to date by which the regulation was issued and when it, it was enforceable was very short. And uh, recognizing that we're going to continue to seek feedback from um, our campus constituents, monitor the impact on resources. Um, Leah and Margot both described a process that involves, especially that formal grievance process, that involves um, new, newer roles for us. We've not had um, required advisors questioning parties before. Uh, so to know exactly how many formal complaints we're going to have, how many advisors, adjudicators, decision makers, um, just what the impact will be on our resources is something that all three of us have a concern about and will continue to monitor. Um, and we're going to watch for variables that may impact the enforcement or what the advice is from the Department of Education. And we're going to um, continue to update our materials and make sure that to the extent um, that our campus community understands these new procedures and the new policy or the revised policies for some. And then you heard that um, the guidance under past um, administrations prevented adaptable resolutions or specific types of informal resolutions that now we're able to do. So that means that for many of us, we did not have a lot of resources or um, expertise and training built in some of those um, uh, methods, for instance, mediation, arbitration, or even restorative practices. So we'll, over this next year, be, be looking to build those resources as well. I think that concludes our, um, our formal presentation and we're happy to answer questions you may have. Any, any questions from anyone in attendance? I, I have a couple, but I'll wait till the last if anybody else has questions. Sure, uh, this, is, this is David Barker. Um, I, I, you, you mentioned that you had consulted with uh, other uh, universities uh, across the country, and I just wonder if you're seeing other universities doing things differently than, uh, than Iowa is doing. Uh, in particular, are you seeing any of them uh, outsourcing their uh, Title IX compliance? I can step into that. Um, we, we've seen a little bit of everything. Certainly, we are not an outlier by any means. All three of our institutions are fitting right in with what I would say the norm across the country is. There are definitely institutions across the country who are outsourcing different components or even their entire operation. Uh, this is hitting hard from a resource perspective for the smaller schools in particular. Um, because of the need to assure that we do not have conflict or bias in any of the roles. So when some of us have been used to wearing multiple hats throughout a process, we're not able to do that very easily anymore. And so some of the smaller schools are probably having a more difficult time adapting and needing to do some more outsourcing. Thank you. At Iowa, we'll, we'll likely use um, external um, decision makers or adjudicators for, a hear for the hearing, as well as uh, individuals who are full-time employees in other roles around campus. And you and I will be using external decision makers as well. So Iowa State, we're now talking to um, Drake, um, <laughs> specifically to try to fulfill that advisor role um, for students who may be willing to assist us in that. Um, trying to be resourceful for resources. I have colleagues in Oregon who they're talking about outsourcing the entire program based on the potential for litigious um, outcomes from um, respondents and from complainants, um, specifically to the hearing process and the cross-examination um, piece, which is different and vulnerable for um, potential victims. Regent Linda Meyer, I have a question. This is this is Sherry Bates. Um, first of all, I commend all of you. That is very complicated uh, material and processes to put in place. I guess my concern is the campus students at large. Will this be a continuing education piece? Because it certainly changes for them, I would think, as to how they see if they have a complaint or if they're the one that's being you know, uh, complain about. So do, do you see, what, what do you see down that path? 
So certainly providing um, ongoing training to students and employees is really critical as we kind of roll out these adapted or modified or new policies and procedures. Um, I think the other, in, to get to what you're asking is if somebody who's gonna be involved in the process will understand, we have to make sure that our outreach and that initial assessment that we're doing with complainants clearly describes all of the possible um, processes that could be used, including the adaptable um, resolution or perhaps the request to just receive support measures. So some of it is being paying attention to the outreach to, and the individual work that we do with the parties who are involved in the process. And then all of us have mandatory education programs in place and looking at the content within those programs. Often those programs are really emphasizing primary prevention and not high on policy education. It's been my experience that people, um, it's hard to, to engage folks in policy education. Um, mostly folks tend to think about, I'm not gonna need to need that information. This, this isn't gonna happen to me. Um, and then, uh, so because of that framework, we kind of look then at the resources and the information that we have on our website so that there's some information just in time when people need it because they're being impacted by the procedure. Thank um, you. At Iowa State, we are really concerned that the regulations and the changes and how detailed and the policy changes and the difficulty in understanding them will chill um, the likelihood that people will make complaints for sexual assault, um, specifically because it is, um, we have individuals who may be going through trauma and the entire process seems to be so filled with um, different turns and options that they may not um, go forward. So we're really thinking about what do we do about encouraging reporting um, based on this being a, a significant change. Thank you. Oh, Patty, Patty you're, you're on mute, I think. Patty, I think you're on mute. Were you trying to say something? Put her glasses on. Mute. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, are are there? Are you making specific efforts to have all of the students be aware of these pretty extensive changes and have all the information available to them um, and as they are at the universities, not waiting until something happens. Yeah, um, so there was a notification that students received um, about the changes. And the um, we have a number of places where we're interacting with our first year students and, and beyond um, and educating them about the, the information as it relates to the procedure. Um, it's combined in an online program. It's combined in um, workshops that our prevention team is providing. And then looking at where our students already organized, particularly partnering with housing and our Greek life, as well as other student um, organizations and um, going in and providing the, the educational pro programs um, and specifically uh, trying to encourage them to um, engage in the policy education. A specific workshop on that. Okay, I, yes, I, I think that's really necessary because there are a lot of changes here and I'm not even saying that the students were aware of the before the changes, but everybody right. needs to know this one. So thank you. Yeah. Any, any other questions or comments? I, I just, uh, uh, most of my questions were answered by one question. As the three of you were meeting, are you pretty confident that there's a, a, a fair continuity of interpretation between the three universities um, with regard to the changes? I would say Absolutely. yes. I, in fact, I would say we're probably more in line with one another now than we have been historically. Not that we were ever far apart from one another, but the, these new regulations are so prescriptive, it doesn't offer a lot of uh, chance to vary from it. 
Thank you. Any, any other questions before we move on? Thank, thank you very much for your report and, and uh, your hard work on this on this topic and, and change is difficult and uh, you never know when there's changes in administration there are always a lot of change that seems to come out of uh, the Department of Labor and Department of Education and civil rights so you have to go through these different permutations from time to time unfortunately but that's the business that we're in. The, the, the next item is uh, campus and student life uh, report during COVID-19. And we have uh, Paula Knudsen, Vice President for Student Affairs, Sarah Hansen, Vice President for Student Life at the University of Iowa. Paul is at the University of Northern Iowa. And Diane, is it Kanigi or Nigi? Head registered nurse at Iowa Kanigi. School for the day. I, I'm sorry to say that correctly. Again. I'm sorry, say your name again. Diane. It is Kanigi. Kanigi, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think Paula was gonna be the first presenter on this. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, hosting us. We're happy to join you this morning. And I have two new um, colleagues who started amidst the COVID here, uh, which is um, incredibly difficult to start during a pandemic and all the other events that are occurring around our world. Uh, I've tried to convince Toya that this is not <coughs> normal, but we're yet to, yet to prove differently. So because I've been I'm entering my senior year, I got chosen to start us off. But what I'd like to say is that we all have a lot in common as we're working through this and we're, we're communicating regularly and many of our staffs are also communicating on a regular basis as we try to find out what best practices and how we move forward is. For instance, our health directors are meeting on a weekly basis, in part to support one another, in part to share what they're learning. And we have learned a lot over the past six months as we've been through this pandemic and all the other unrest that's going around in the world. So. Uh, I'm gonna kick us off here with talking about some of the adaptations, but please recognize that all, all three campuses have probably more in common than different in, on this front as we battle this. So some of the things you know that we've done, um, we've tried to distance classes. That's a little easier at UNI than it is on the larger campuses. Uh, the point is really to try to get few points of contact within that six feet uh, of each other so that we aren't quarantining as many people as we, as we have to. At UNI, we're blessed to be able to have 80% of our classes either in person or um, a hybrid model. So those are, those are working fairly well. We're not seeing a spread in the classroom and we're not quarantining as many people because we've adapted along the way to try to make sure that those points of contact are, are minimal. So um, I, we all will go into our numbers, but. Some of the things we've done is we've all set up res hall quarantine spaces and res hall isolation spaces. We've learned on that front too, how to manage to meals and how to support those students, um, how to stay in touch and get offer them connection. Because as you can imagine for anyone, quarantining for 14 days is difficult. But if you're 18 and have only been away from your home for a week and are trying to meet people, 14 days can seem like an eternity. So. We had some learning curves, I think we all did um, in the early days, and we've improved and we've improved how we're supporting and engaging our students when they do have to go in quarantine or isolation. And just to distinguish those two, quarantine is when you've been in contact with somebody within six feet for more than 15 minutes who's tested positive. So those students aren't necessarily positive, but they are at some level of risk. Isolation is for students who have tested positive. And the, the unfairness is that because of the way the disease works is that the isolation folks, because there's a delay in testing and identifying the risk, they only have to wait out 10 days. Whereas if you're in quarantine because of the nature of the disease, you have to wait 14 days. So if you're an 18 year old, you can imagine the frustration at, hold it, I'm not ill. Um, I didn't do this, who did this to me? And so there's a lot of question that goes in that process. And we're all, we've got our health, health folks, our mental health folks that are working really long hours to try to help students work through 
this process that doesn't seem fair to them um, as an 18, 20 year old kick starting off um, college. So we all have face mask mandates um, and I think all of us um, are doing well on campus. Our students in the, act, in the buildings are following those guidelines well. They're cleaning their things off themselves. They're using the hand spray. Um, we're all a little concerned that off-campus behaviors is sometimes they let their guard down and that becomes a little more difficult. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. Uh, we also all have done student seating assignments so that we can monitor any spread that occurs in the classroom when they do have in-person classes so that if somebody tests positive, we know who was in vicinity of them and can notify them and quarantine appropriately. We've also made adjustments on the, um, on the social side of things. So for instance, our rec directors have all met and talked and while they do some things differently, they've managed to um, alter their programming so that students can still work out. Um, it might be different on campuses. We require a mask in our rec center. So if you can imagine working out, um, which I need to do more of, but if you can imagine working out wearing a mask, um, that becomes very difficult. So it, we're trying to convey the message of don't push yourself to the limits, just get a healthy workout. And this is not the time to try to stretch your outer limits. We're also doing adaptations to have <coughs> that aren't heavy in contact. For instance, we're offering um, four person, uh, four on four sand volleyball um, and that um, badminton, for instance, we tried to do some with esports to help students still engage on that front. We're offer, offering virtual programming. For instance, we had a program that was sip and paint, um, and that's not the kind of sipping we're talking about. It was they got a can of soda and an art bag that we had prepared for them, and then we zoomed them in or streamed them in and had an art instructor teach them how to do some art maneuvers. Uh, we had great response to that. We had to almost, we had to cut it off at 200 because that was our, the limit that we could do. So we're doing virtual things. We're trying to do some in-person things um, and we're doing things like peer mentoring mostly over Zoom. Although I can tell you, I still offer students to meet in person and I'm taking great advantage of the Adirondack chairs that sit around and we move them eight feet apart. And I talk to students, especially freshmen who are struggling or our student leaders. So we're adapting, but I have to tell you, um, our students are dealing with social isolation and that's troubling, um, especially for a, a young adult that's trying to figure out the world. And I'm a little, I wish we wouldn't have used the term social distancing. I wish we would have used physical distancing because all of us still need that social connection. And so trying to teach students that low risk behavior that still allows them that connection. They're still having health and financial concerns uh, during these times. There's certainly political, racial upheaval, and then you combine it with natural disasters. And our students are finding a way despite that. Their resilience is showing. Um, they're working through it. We're learning some things. There will be, I just had a conversation with a student uh, leader yesterday, and he said, how do we do, a, how do we, convey the things that we want to keep when this is all over. So can we keep having hand sanitizers out? Can we keep cleaning supplies out? Can we keep our telemental health and telehealth counseling appointments? So there are some things that we've really learned in this process along the way. And I, I think more than ever, we've learned the solidarity between our campuses and those roles that are learning and trying to support our students as we get back um, to some sense of normalcy. So I'll stop there and let my colleagues jump in. I think Sarah, you're next. Yes, thanks Paula. Um, thanks for setting the stage so well because I do think we have a lot of commonalities and um, I'll just touch on a, a few additional things um, around some of those adaptations and also maybe some of the challenges that we've experienced on our campus too. Um, I would say we have made a lot of the similar adaptations that um, Paula mentioned around things like our density within housing, our dining 
uh, protocols. So our, our dining is grab and go or carry out our rec services. You make an appointment to um, go and reserve time. Everything is physically spaced. As Paula mentioned, we also require masks within our recreation facilities. Our student organizations are are virtual and that includes, um, we had fraternity and sorority life recruitment processes that were all virtual, all done through Zoom. Um, our famous dance marathon will be virtual as well. And um, so a lot of changes around that. And some of those are kind of heartbreaking changes because we know how much, for instance, dance marathon means on our campuses. Um, We've expanded a lot of our programming around things like resiliency, mindfulness, the mental health supports. Um, and as Paula said, a lot of these uh, issues intersect. So students are experiencing trouble around, um, you know, that maybe the new Title IX regulations are, are scary for them or the protests and um, racial unrest that's happened is troubling for them. Um, or friends are getting sick with COVID and that's troubling. For, so we're trying to make sure that we have a lot of um, just-in-time resources for them. So students fill out on our campus a self-report form when they have either um, tested positive or been identified through contact tracing as, a, as someone who needs to um, quarantine. And as a part of that self-report form, they can request additional help or request an outreach and they can also let us know if they've already notified their faculty. Our student care and assistance operation, we've added staff in that area and they are outreaching to every student that fills out that self-report form. They're also tracking down the students who maybe haven't self-reported, but we've found out through the Johnson County Public Health Partnership that they have um, been tested or identified. They're reaching out to those students to find out what they need immediately, as well as periodically reaching out to them during their quarantine and isolation period. So we've got um, student health doing that outreach, mental health folks doing that outreach to check in. Um, for our on-campus students who we are moving into quarantine and isolation, we, um, I think, are doing now since that first issue that we had a better job of helping them move. They get a bag of snacks that tides them over until their meal, uh, first meals kick in. We have arranged transportation back and forth for um, testing or from the, ET, the emergency room if needed. We've got those embedded counselors in the residence halls uh, as well that are kind of checking in with folks. Um, I, I know within our operation, our Johnson County Public Health has maintained control over the contact tracing. You know, it's within the Iowa code, our public health departments in the counties are in charge of that, but every county has handled it somewhat differently. Um, we have a very good relationship with Johnson County Public Health. They've hired additional staff to be able to contact trace, and we've been able to keep up with that and make sure that we are tracking those down. Um, I would say, maybe just two other things, then I wanna um, turn it over to my friend from Iowa State. We've also tried to be really flexible, as Paula said, with our students and with our faculty and staff with regard to delivery of courses, um, work arrangements. So we have a, a temporary alternative uh, work arrangement opportunity that student, that faculty and staff can request. So if they would prefer to teach online and it makes sense for them to do that. Um, you know, they're not teaching a studio arts class or some, or a lab that has to be in person. Um, we have processed, I think, uh, over 400, nearly 500 of those requests from faculty, graduate students, uh, staff who want to have some sort of a temporary arrangement. That might be to teach part of their class online, to have an adjusted work schedule that puts them in the office, periodically, but not necessarily every day or some other adjustment. We also have a temporary uh, alternative learning arrangement um, opportunity. So if students have one of the medical vulnerabilities to COVID that's identified by the CDC, they can request to have an all virtual schedule or have other adjustments in their schedule. Um, and even if they don't have a CDC condition, our student care and assistance office has had um, many students that maybe don't have that medical condition but have concerns about being uh, in the classroom in real time 
we've worked with them to adjust their schedule as possible. Um, just, a, I would say a couple of the challenges to echo what, what Paula has said. I think one of the challenges for us was students arriving on campus positive, um, but not necessarily even waiting for their test results at home. So we had some students that tested at home and then showed up and then said, oh, hey, I'm positive. And we had to kind of track that down. I would say our off-campus behavior has been another challenge and we've been um, really forceful with um, suspending student orgs if they've violated things uh, or not adhered to social distancing. The bar closure in our county has been a tremendous help to us. Our numbers have absolutely plummeted since that time. Um, we haven't had a triple digit uh, set of student cases on a daily basis since uh, September 4th. We are down into you know 20 cases a day at this point. And so just to be really frank, I am worried about September 20th, which is when our uh, that mandate from the governor is set to expire. Um, because we know that, as Paula said, our transmission has not been in the classroom. It actually hasn't even been in the residence halls. Most of our cases are off campus. They're in congregate apartments. They're coming from downtown socializing and they're from fraternity and sorority houses. And so that's kind of been one of our biggest challenges. And we'll continue to, to push for um, students understanding you know, the behavioral expectations, but that environment is a, is a real challenge for us. So I will um, hand it over to Toya and then of course, we'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, uh, Chair Lindenmeyer for the warm welcome. My initial welcome to Iowa was the duratio. So this is much more calm <laughs> and inviting and I'm so pleased to be here with you all today. Um, my colleagues have really done an excellent job setting the context of what we're all experiencing, and I'm grateful for the collaboration between our universities and, of course, the support to the new kid on the block. So thank you. Uh, as many of you know, Iowa State University has public dashboards where both uh, daily and weekly data are posted. Uh, since the beginning of our semester, which was August 17th, through uh, our most recent reporting period of September the 12th, we have processed over 5,500 COVID tests. And I'm pleased to report that Iowa State has seen a decrease in positive tests and positive cases since September the 1st. Uh, so it kind of echoes what uh, Sarah just mentioned. Um, I think we are finally getting a, 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 the message across to our students about the importance of uh, following uh, our campaign, uh, Cyclone Cares campaign, which talks about wearing your face coverings, uh, physically distancing, washing your hands often, and staying home if you're ill. So we are pleased to see uh, those uh, decrease in numbers. Uh, as my colleagues also mentioned, we have taken uh, similar steps with regards to um, uh, residence halls, um, some of the activities that take place with our students um, in terms of most of them moving into virtual activities. Those activities that are in person are of course physically distanced, keeping um, uh, their mask on while they're meeting. We do of course have some groups who love to meet in person, uh, particularly our student government association, uh, but they have done a wonderful job of spacing themselves accordingly, keeping the physically dis physical distance be amongst them. Um, additionally, I do want to uh, address some of the concerns that people have uh, raised with regards to isolation and quarantine and how that uh, has an impact on our students. I think we've all experienced our own uh, mental health challenges and stress throughout the past six months. And of course, that seems to be magnified with our students. And so we're trying to do uh, little things to support our students. We sent out personal notes to all of our students who are in isolation and quarantine, just letting them know that we're thinking about them and even gave them a little uh, gift card so they can go to Panera once they're finally able to escape and, and get back out into the real world. And we think it's so important to make those personal connections with students because we do realize that this is a challenging time. 
And as Sarah mentioned, our counseling center has actually seen an increase uh, in students from all across the campus, a uh, variety of ages and, and majors, et cetera, who just need someone to talk to. And so we've increased our virtual capacity to do that. However, we do still see students in person when they are in crisis. Um, but our staff has really uh, made the adjustment and made the pivot uh, to or in order to accommodate those students who are coming in. Um, additionally, I did want to speak to uh, some of the concerns that colleagues have raised. We too are not necessarily seeing the transmission of the disease in the classroom or on campus. We're seeing a lot of uh, students who are coming through us based on uh, transmission off campus. And so one of the things that Iowa State did was implement a new policy with regards to large social gatherings. And um, we have had some students who have violated that policy and have taken the necessary steps uh, to correct that behavior. Uh, I think that that word is spreading. Uh, we were driving through the neighborhoods uh, on Saturday, which just so happened to be our first football game. And we did not see uh, many parties or people uh, out congregating as um, we may have uh, towards the beginning of the semester. So we're hoping that that message uh, is resonating with our students. We have heard that our students want to stay here. They are enjoying the, uh, being with their colleagues. Um, uh, it's different and we've all had to make adjustments, both student staff and faculty, but we wanna make sure that we still ensure that they have a wonderful student experience here at Iowa State University. And so I'm pleased to be a part of that team. Uh, prior to my arrival at Iowa State University, I served as the vice president for the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And during that time, uh, prior to my arrival here in Iowa, I was talking to college and university presidents from all over the country and hearing some of their plans and what they were uh, hoping to accomplish and some of their free fears and anxieties, to be quite honest, about what returning to campus would look like. And so I've shared with people who have asked, how crazy are you to relocate in the middle of a pandemic? Uh, that I would not have made the choice, uh, particularly to come to Iowa State University, if I wasn't confident in the things that we had done, the planning that had taken place over the summer, uh, that really solidified my decision to come here. And I'm grateful for my colleagues across uh, the state who have worked uh, with me and welcoming me, but not only helping me navigate uh, this new terrain. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Diane from the Iowa School for the Deaf. And I believe after that, we'll open the floor for questions. Yes, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to present to uh, the Committee on the Safety Protocols for COVID-19 that we put in place at Iowa School for the Deaf. Thank you to John Cool too for asking me to present in his absence. Since the beginning of this pandemic, um, literally the uh, first of the year, we've been putting plans in place uh, to address what could happen, potentially happen during the year. And at that time, ISD administration established a team to meet on a daily basis, which has been modified over the past six months, currently meeting a minimum of twice a week. We have COVID-19 specific pandemic protocols written for the schools, the dormitories, transportation, housekeeping, and addressing student and staff illness. These protocols are written with close adherence to CDC and Iowa Department of Public Health guidelines, as well as in corroboration with our county health department. The protocols can all be found on our Iowa School for the Deaf website. We have mandated that masks must be worn by staff and students while inside buildings and also while outside if physical distancing cannot be maintained. Masks are worn at all times during transportation by staff and students. We do have mask breaks built into the school day, um, certain times of the school day and uh, for certain activities. We realize that wearing masks, especially for the residential students um, to wear a mask all day, all evening is a lot to ask for students. So we do um, try to build in those mask breaks. We are physical distancing, encouraging small group activities. Desks are spaced in classrooms. Dorm students are not intermingling in large groups. Students are separated into smaller groups for mealtimes and those, those mealtimes are staggered. 
we purchased um, quite a few freestanding hand sanitizers that are placed in the entrances to every building and conference rooms um, in the um, multi-purpose complex at the doors in the gymnasium. We have wall unit hand sanitizers have been installed in, uh, installed in every classroom and pump hand sanitizer bottles are everywhere on campus, literally on every flat surface. Routine cleaning of restrooms, handrails, doors, and the push bars um, and all common areas has been increased. Spray disinfectant um, and or disinfectant wipes are in every classroom, office, vehicle, and really every department on campus. Students help to clean and disinfect their desks and work areas um, after class before leaving the classroom. Dormitory staff are doing additional cleaning and disinfecting in their areas during their shifts. Vehicles are cleaned and, and disinfected after each use. And in the event of a known positive case, the classroom work or living area is closed off and deep cleaned and disinfected. Our student and staff illness protocol addresses assessment, when to isolate or quarantine, and when to return to school or work. When a student presents with COVID symptoms during school or dormitory time, they're isolated in a separate area in our health center until a parent can pick them up. We follow the Iowa Department of Public Health guidelines for risk factors if a student presents with one high risk or two low risk symptoms associated with COVID-19, they go home for further direction from their own physician. Before a student can return to school, we require a copy, um, either a copy of their COVID testing if they've tested negative or an alternate diagnosis from their physician. If a student tests positive, we follow the CDC's symptom-based or test-based strategies for them to return to school. Students that have been determined to have had close contact with a person who is positive for COVID-19 quarantine at home for 14 days before returning to school. Staff are advised to self-assess self for illness before coming to work, work each day and to consult their physician if they have symptoms of COVID. We have determined that all of our staff are essential workers. If a staff person reports that they have had a possible exposure to COVID-19, we have mitigation guidelines for them to follow to continue to come to work. Again, if they become symptomatic, they're to leave work and consult their doctor. If a staff member tests positive for COVID, we follow the CDC's symptom-based or test-based strategies for return to work. In that case, we um, do contact tracing within the school in alliance with the area, area county health departments. We have established connect, connections with the Pottawatomie County Division of Public Health and um, either myself or um, Mr. Cool are consulting with them as needed, which is uh, seems to be frequently. When the students went home last spring, we provided non-mandatory online educational opportunities for them. And those learning opportunities were offered to all students from preschool through four plus. We currently have five students who for health reasons are participating in remote learning. And there is a plan in place to provide remote learning for students that are in quarantine and should the needs ar need arise if we have to send student, all students home. The IES BBI staff who work on the ISD campus in Council Bluffs follow the protocols established that we've established at ISD. Other IES BBI staff across the state follow the policies of the AEA that they serve. When a school district's protocols are different than that AEA, the staff person is expected to follow the school's protocols. And if uh, these protocols are less restrictive than the staff person is to continue following the protocols established by the AEA. We have had no positive student, uh, no positive COVID um, uh, results for students since we started on August 17th. And from July to present, we have only had four staff um, COVID cases, and they were outside cases, not coming from school contact. And that is the end of my presentation.
Thanks, Diane. Um, before I open this up for questions, I, I just wanted to make a comment that and convey the thanks from the regents for your efforts uh, and your staff's efforts during these unprecedented times. I, I, I mean, the, the social and the, the health and the economic conditions make this a, just a monumental crisis really that higher education has never faced before. The social piece is reminiscent of the late 60s and 70s when I was an undergraduate, <laughs> but uh, the other two pieces, the health and the economic situation, put this whole thing on steroids. So uh, I, I know I'm speaking, I feel confident that I'm speaking for all the regions when we say we appreciate uh, what you do every day on, on the front line and what your staffs do. So thank you so much for keeping, doing what you can to keep our students safe and um, continuing the, the good effort there. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask Zach. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for the presentation. Uh, I, I'm impressed with what everybody is doing on campus. But Zach, could you give us a little student perspective on attitudes? <coughs> and, you know, we, we hear from some about the need to definitely close classes and yet classes aren't where that's where the spread is. So could could you just talk a little bit about students yeah i can uh real quick um definitely uh there's um students that more so i think want to be on campus and since uh the actions the institution have made i think they've gotten the message through uh what they do need to do to be here um i do also want to commend at the time the institution for the services they're providing uh in mental health though and uh, reach out to make those personal relationships with students because um, having my own freshman uh, pledge son and uh, interacting with a lot of students uh, now more than ever, that's uh, very, very important. Um, so I think they're doing a great job to provide those services. And I think Paula made a great point it was when this is all done, um, how can these students uh, maybe advocate for those things? Because it's been uh, very, very helpful with all these students. And uh, like I said, I think everybody's kind of on page of what we need to do to stay here. And um, like I said, I think our institutions are doing a great job to conveying that message and uh, providing uh, what they need to our students. So, so do you see overall um, the student body really wants to be responsible and doing their part? Yes, uh, overall, I think most of the student body is doing their part. Um, you know, I think <coughs> anybody on campus without their mask, uh, social distancing. Uh, it's very big, even with the activities we do, uh, a lot of activities provide um, Zoom uh, to log in if you are uncomfortable with being activities, and they also do a good job of uh, being a part um, and any violations, obviously, the institution hears about. So I think the student body uh, at first, uh, you know, kind of came in uh, not with the right mindset, but I think now uh, it's kind of clear what we need to do, and uh, I agree. I, I'm I am a little concerned about the 20th uh, end of the mandate and where things will be there. I think um, that possibly needs to be extended. I obviously don't know where the place is on that, but uh, that data is a little concerning to me. And uh, I sure hope from our actions, though, that um, it won't be anything like it was at the start of the year. So am I right in my thinking that at all of our campuses, students have the opportunity to address their own fears if they feel a real need to get on uh, virtual education instead of in class that is available for everybody is that true yep yes that is correct okay thanks Thank Nancy. You and zach any any other questions or comments yeah um i had a couple of questions um so we heard, I think that 80% uh, at UNI of the courses are in-person or hybrid. Um, I wonder if we could just get the percentages from, from uh, all of the institutions that are in-person, online, and hybrid. I think ours are quite similar to that. Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're about 75% are online. Yes, and we're, uh, Iowa State is similar to that as well. Uh, we do have, um, uh, as uh, the regent pointed out earlier, 
students are able to, if they have concerns, reach out to faculty members and uh, indicate if they do not want to, uh, do not feel safe continuing uh, in-person classes, making other accommodations and our student assistance uh, program works with them in order to make those uh, arrangements for them, should that be the case. Okay, Laura, this is Bruce, not, not to uh, correct you, but to update you as of Friday, it was 78 for us. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you and I did I get that right? Eighty percent are in person or hybrid. Is that what? That's correct. Okay, so you're okay. So we've had so, so we have a fair number of in person classes, and as I understand it, we think that there has been no transmission in classes. If that continues, would you recommend that we move to more in-person instruction either later this semester or next semester? This is Mark uh, uh, at UNI. Um, the moving to more in-person instruction is going to be difficult. Um, you know, we need to continue the the physical distancing, and having the classrooms to do that is what what really limits that. So. Um, we are working to maximize the number of classes, sections, uh, students, and credit hours that we can get into either a in person or fully fully in person or, or hybrid. We want to maximize that, but we are constrained by by facilities. And you know, one of the things that that happens, even if you you think about going to say fifty percent of capacity, you can have the case pretty quickly that. Um, you know, you've one person tests positive, there'll be six other people all of a sudden you've got to put into isolation. And uh, that number is way, way too high, right? So we need to physically distance in our classrooms as much as possible. And uh, so making sure that we've got the physical distances we've got, we need using as many of our facilities, even some non-academic facilities for classrooms has been essential for us to be able to make this. Now, is you and I, so if I'm hearing this right, is you and I doing more in-person instruction than the other two universities as a percentage? Yes. Okay. Um, how much of that 80% is hybrid? I mean, if you're looking at hybrid versus in-person, how, how should we think about that? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what that split is. Um, when we look at hybrid, you know, this uh, can be look an awful lot like face-to-face. -face. One of the hybrid situations we have is a classroom of, of 50 that we can't get into a classroom. So the instructor has split them in half. And one day they meet with half the class, on Tuesday they meet with half the class, Thursday they meet with the other half of the class, right? Um, and the other part of the class can be in online, um, Zoom in or whatever. So they're, they're finding these creative ways to continue to really be connected with those students and have that face-to-face -face instruction uh, in a classroom that's really, it's really spread out um, to be able to get the six foot distancing. So you found ways to do more in person and you think you're at your limit of your ability to do that, it sounds like. At the other, at Iowa State and University of Iowa, do you believe that there's capacity or uh, ability to uh, move to more in-person instruction? This is University of Iowa, this is Bruce. We're, um, I'm not comfortable that we have the testing capacity and the region, uh, reagents in, in specifically to allow us to um, test a large enough percentage of our population to get the, we're going to need to get the 5% or lower before we start talking about going back to online instruction. And we're well over that right, right now. In our, I'm sorry? The 5% was, you need to get to 5% of, of what? We need to get a an infection rate of, of under five percent, and okay. right now, the last I checked, I think the county was at twelve point six. So we've got a long way to go. Um, but to answer your specific question, we have a, a lot of unused uh, classrooms um, and capacity. That's not the issue. The issue is um, the the risk. There's so many unknowns with this virus that. I don't know why we would run the risk of rushing back to um, face to face, to be honest with you. And so we'd much rather let everybody choose their level of comfort and, and, and let through time, I think there's a lot going on in the testing area. So these rapid tests, if we could do the entire population every day, you know, so we do 40 or 
say 40,000 tests every day all are, are that's where we need to get to to okay. get our testing down because if you test negative today you could be positive tomorrow and it, it's so it's not like once a week we just need to rapidly this country is way under testing okay so just to be clear the infection rate you're talking about is the percentage of people who positive. take test who are positive not the, not the percentage of the population but the percentage who test who are positive okay. correct and, and Iowa State? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, President Harold. You know, we are uh, cautiously optimistic as we have seen a decline in our positive tests since September 1st. But I think there's a lot of variables at place um, <laughs> in play right now. We are, of course, uh, examining classroom availability, spacing, um, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, we have been very intentional in uh, the number of uh, seats available uh, inside classrooms. And um, I think it also uh, goes back to some of our students, whether or not they feel fully comfortable and uh, safe within some of our classrooms. And so I think we'll all, all of the institutions will be going kind of uh, uh, week by week. This thing seems to be changing uh, rapidly. And so um, while we're cautiously optimistic, we won't, don't want to jump into anything that would ultimately lead to mass spread uh, just because of one simple decision or uh, something that uh, we've decided on that may not have been uh, quite at the right time. And, and Regent Barker, I think the one other point I would make here um, is while we talk about a lot of students would prefer to have face-to-face, -face, I'm not sure we have good data to support that at all. I am currently teaching. I have a class of 30, so small sample size. They're largely campus leaders. And uh, we're, we're teaching in a blended fashion. And that's a whole new word because we, we just kind of made it up. We're teaching, we have a classroom. It's a classroom that seats 68 students normally. It's currently configured for 30 students. And we leave the, and we're also online with every class. So, and, and students can pick where they want to be for that class. And so far out of, the, or we're, we're through our fourth week, the most I've had physically in class has been five students out of 30. 25 have preferred to stay wherever they are. And, and, and it comes and goes. It's not all the same students either. It's based on other things in their life, I suppose. This may be a new norm. I don't really know. We just don't have, we're talking a lot about how do we get better data on this. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, what I read from the chat, it says that uh, at UNI, they're at 70% face-to-face. Um, just had one other question, and that's uh, for Sarah Hansen. You mentioned uh, that uh, students, uh, the faculty can request uh, to work from home and a faculty can request um, online instruction. Um, you've had 500 requests almost. How many of those requests are denied? I've got that, let me just pull my notes up for you. Um, 460, so 482 requests, 469 have been approved, 12 are pending collegiate approval, and one has been withdrawn at this point. Okay, so none denied. And uh, the students who request uh, yeah. online, is that the same story that Students, uh, we have 352 that were in the COVID related medical category. Um, those have all been uh, approved and then 369 students who requested alternative arrangements that were not related um, to specific health conditions. And most of those are handled in that instance at the collegiate level, but we haven't um, experienced any issues with students being able to adjust as well. So those have all been approved also? As far as my, yeah, to my knowledge, yes. Okay, thank you, thanks very much. Sure. Any other questions or comments for the presenters? Uh, this is Nancy Dunkel. And I just want to, again, echo what others have said before, is that I can't say thanks enough for all your hard work in these times when you're making decisions daily and things change daily. And my gosh, you have uh, big jobs and I sincerely appreciate everything that you do. 
Thanks for your support. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, any other uh, next item on the agenda is uh, any other business? You have any other questions for this group uh, regarding situations on campus specifically? If, if not, we'll convene our meeting and our next meeting is scheduled for November 18th at uh, the University of Northern Iowa. Thanks everybody for your time today and, and appreciate everybody's efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
ready, we'll go. Two thousand and twenty-two. We'll start with John Nash on deferred maintenance. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Regent Dokovich, Regent Lyndon Meyer, members of the committee. Uh, presenting with the facilities report with me today is Rod Leonard's with the University of Iowa, Paul Fellini with Iowa State University, Michael Zwanziger with the University of Northern Iowa, and Marina Johnson with Iowa Public Radio. Um, Brock, if you would put the first slide up on that first presentation, please. Very good. Um, so, so in the facilities report, there are separate capital plans uh, laid out by each of the universities. In fact, there's even a capital plan for University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. And obviously these plans are lists of capital improvement projects that the universities and the hospital, they plan to start in the next year. Um, what I'm gonna do today is talk about just one of those plans and that particular plan is our, is our official request for state funding for a whole list of projects. So Brock, if you'd go to the next slide, please. So this plan, it looks like plans in the past years, except for this year, we have pushed all projects ahead one year so that the only request for FY22 is a $30 million request for deferred maintenance. And I'll be talking about deferred maintenance a little bit in a little bit here, but um, that request is shown in the blue under FY22 there. It's the only request we have, and we are obviously um, trying to draw attention to deferred maintenance, and we have good reasons for doing that. We've never done that uh, in past years per se. We've always had deferred maintenance as one of the projects that were, were listed, except this year we're taking it to the very front and we are uh, pushing all the other projects uh, ahead one year. Uh, so again, it's a $30 million request for deferred maintenance, and then that would be followed by another $70 million over the next four years for a total of $100 million. Um, I mean, the University of Iowa's Pentecrest Modern Modernization, Iowa State University's Veterinary Diagnostic Lab Edition, and their LeBaron Hall replacement, Iowa School for the Deaf has three projects on there, Girls Dormitory, HVAC Electrical, um, GN, GN Greco Hall, which is their largest, largest building, um, the exterior rehabilitation, and the boys' dorm within that building, the HVAC for the boys' dorm, those three projects are on the list. Um, Iowa Public Radio has two projects, equipment for ISU, UNI, and the University of Iowa licensed properties, and uh, replaced transmission equipment for WIFM and KSUIFM, and UNI has their Learning Commons project on there as well. So all good projects, all these projects are <clears throat> for general education fund facilities, they're for classrooms, labs, uh, some administration, but there are no athletic projects on there. There are no projects for residence halls. Any of the self-supporting auxiliary um, enterprises do not have projects uh, in this list. Again, this is just a list for requesting for state funding. Um, Brock, if you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so back to deferred maintenance for a second. Uh, this is just a a chart showing deferred maintenance that's been completed or knocked out by the institutions over the last 28 years. Uh, they have done a very good job of doing that. Um, the 
average amount of money spent by the institutions is $21 million a year over those 28 years. I mean, lately, obviously it's gonna be more than the 21 million, but um, it suffices to say the 21 million is what we spend every year for deferred maintenance. And so if we ever do get that 30 million that we're asking for, the 30 million would be an addition to that 21 million that the institutions are spending on deferred maintenance. So we can try to stem the tide of deferred maintenance and try to get ahead of it. Uh, we got a long way to go, but we need to do something to kind of climb back into the ball game with minimizing or, or reducing deferred maintenance the best we can. If you uh, go to the next slide, please, Brock. So the 21 million that I just mentioned is shown here on this blue line across the bottom. And those are, that's, that's deferred maintenance completed and put behind us. And um, it's, it's on a chart here comparing it to deferred maintenance that's still out there. And so as of today, we have $1.2 billion worth of deferred maintenance that um, it's, 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 it, it just simply needs to be addressed somehow. And uh, <coughs> after some discussions in the board office, we really just decided that, I mean, it, it's time to do something different and new and that, hence the, the $30 million request. Um, Brock, if you go to the next slide, please. So why, why 30 million? How did we come up with that? Well, one of uh, the reasons uh, has to do with um, the rough year that we're having and that uh, money is, is going to be tight and uh, that was brought on by the coronavirus and by the derecho. And so we are being sensitive to that. One of the other reasons is, is that when you compare the regents, Board of Regents square footage to other, to eight, excuse me, to seven other state agencies. And that's what this slide shows here. You'll see the Board of Regents in the third column there. Um, and then the other seven other state agencies. The dark blue is state funded square footage. The light blue uh, area is uh, our auxiliary facilities, our self-supported facilities. So athletics, residence halls, et cetera, are shown in the light blue. <clears throat> but the reason for showing this slide is to compare our dark blue section with our nearest competitor, which is the Department of Administrative Services in the very first column and, um, or DAS. And DAS has 20% of all this state funded square footage. We have 30% of it. Um, DAS gets 20 million a year from the state uh, for their deferred maintenance. So they call that major maintenance. And so we have 50% more state funded square footage. So you add 50% to their 20 million and that's how we got to the 30 million. Um, it might be kind of a cockamamie way of getting to the 30 million, but um, I like to compare us to other state agencies that have already gotten money from the state so that we can help build our case for the 30 million. Um, let's see, Brock, if you go to the next slide, please. And so if we did get the 30 million, we would ask the board to allocate those funds to the institutions. And one possible proposed way that we could do that is to uh, do that based on the amount of state funded square footage each institution has. So we have 19 and a half million gross square feet of state funded square footage. Um, and you can see by the chart there that University of Iowa has 46%, Iowa State 38, UNI 13, and then special schools have 3%. So um, it's just one idea. We can talk about it. I don't want to get too far ahead of things right now, but um, if again, if we ever were were appropriated that thirty million dollars, um, this would be one way to look at it. I think it seems fair to me, but I'm, I'm we're open to other ideas, and um, we can always talk about that as we go. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. You can go to the next slide, Brock. So thank you, thank you, uh, Regent Dokovich. Thanks, John. Any questions for John? Sure. Uh, this is David Barker. Um, at one, um, in in coming up with the number for deferred maintenance, is there any um, prioritization or categorization that you have um, in, in showing you know which which how much of that deferred maintenance you know absolutely has to be done 
for the facility to continue, you know, how much would be uh, you know, important and how much would be, you know, desired, something like that? Regent Barker, we do not have uh, a list like that. We have, uh, now let me put it this way. So if somebody asked us, if you were funded the 30 million, where would that money go? What projects would those go to? Yes, we are. We have those right, right now. We have lists of projects that that 30 million would go to right this very second. And those projects in those lists are the hottest, uh, worst deferred maintenance that the universities have. And so those are projects that are uppermost in the university's minds as to those are the ones they want to knock out. So I'm probably not answering your question very well, but I, I would say that the list that we had would suffice to, to, to qualify for that 30 million very, very well. John, <coughs> John, Mr. Rod Leonard's David, uh, to, to possibly give you part of an answer from the University of Iowa, we absolutely have uh, the, the projects that garner the, the most need uh, in, a, in a combination of a university developed program with or in context with our sight lines, which is our, our um, facility uh, assessment program, uh, we can assess and do assess the, uh, the critical nature and timing of the deferred maintenance needs on campus, prioritize those. John, you're speaking to major projects we have out front in sort of the top eight and the, the, the buildings we would, or the projects we would hit first, but we can go all the way down the line of all of our projects to be able to strategize, because it isn't often that we have um, an influx of state appropriated dollars for the deferred maintenance. So we have to prioritize those with our own funds and the funds that we have. And because there is John's uh, chart showed, there's not nearly enough to go around, we must prioritize. And we have a, we've developed in the last uh, two years, a system that takes sight lines and then plugs in factors of student importance, level of disrepair, those kinds of things, critical natures that allow us a scorecard to determine which projects really have to get to the front of the line first. Right, would we ever be able to get a report that breaks this down into say critical, important and desired, something like that? Yes, oversimplified, yes, we, we can. It's, it's, not, um, by, it's not by those three targets, but ultimately that is exactly how we do it. It's a scoring system. And then that puts them really uh, one through a thousand in order. And um, in addition, Iowa State does a similar um, process that Iowa does as far as they have our top top list of top priorities based on um, the types of deferred maintenance that we have. But we, we go through that process every year. Thanks. Any other questions on deferred maintenance? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to Rod in the University of Iowa. Thank you, Regent Dokovich. Uh, my understanding, John, we'll have slides come up and I'll say next when it's time to say next. Right. <clears throat> um, if we're ready to go, I would say next. Uh, this is our cover sheet and we'll, we'll start first basically with some facts and statistics to get us all uh, on the same page. You can see our campus acreage, 1900 on the main campus in Oakdale. We do have land in other off-campus locations, uh, as you can see there. So slightly more than 2,000 acre, acres to the left side. Uh, well, actually, let's go to the right side. The pie chart gives the general uh, breakdown of spaces we have on campus. And you can take a quick glance at some things that, and, th and these numbers are in line with most peer institutions, most universities around the country. One that often jumps off the uh, page is um, the orange one, classrooms, 3%. Uh, it seems like a small number. People can often oversimplify a university to be nothing but classrooms, but you can see all of the different functions that make up, especially in a um, healthcare uh, university, uh, the pieces of the pie that make up our total uh, university space. Um, and again, right below that, the breakdown of those spaces, uh, space replacement cost and, and value uh, of, of those facilities on our campus. And as you can see, roughly 9 million square feet in general fund space uh, 5 million in University of Iowa hospitals and clinic space, and then the, the balance of auxiliary units on the campus make up slightly more than, than uh, 7 
million gross square feet. That would include housing and athletics and the other auxiliaries we have on campus. Um, also a point out to the left side, utility infrastructure. Of course, it's been a big year for the University of Iowa and our P3 and the partnership we now have with NG. And it should never be um, uh, trivialized the critical importance and part that both the utility system plays on our campus and especially with, with our healthcare system, a never go down, uh, never fail system, um, which we're very proud of. But you can see there some of the physical assets of the utility infrastructure are no small matter as well, miles and miles of, of tunnels and duct banks and cables um, uh, that are serving and are all over the place underneath this campus and are part of our partnership with NG, uh, both the care for and the operation of the utility system. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the challenges, these are not new and they're ones that are obvious and actually speak to some of what John was highlighting. Uh, an important fact to understand when you see the deferred maintenance or renewal dollars escalating over time and the need to get to a balance of care for our campus, that we're not overspending on it, but we're not falling further and further behind. Obviously, an ounce of prevention is certainly a, a, um, a philosophy to follow on this. You can see our general fund buildings average more than 50 years of age. Uh, some of you may know, and you'll see later, we're in this presentation, we're doing work to lower that average uh, and um, reduce the, some of the costs for care related to aging and sometimes obsolete buildings. Uh, UIHC, which has been modernized over the years from the 70s and on, is still at a 27 year average in our auxiliary buildings, almost 50 years. Uh, as you can see, 47 buildings over 100 years of age. We're, we're great keepers both of history and heritage and making those buildings work. When we say we build them to last, we do, uh, but it does take uh, great care and feeding in, in those cases as well. Some photographs show you that constant uh, need and challenge related to modernizing our buildings, caring for deferred maintenance that is underfunded, but um, critical when we have more than 250 buildings on our campus, all of them aging, as you can imagine, at the same rate. And, and um, even with good systems, uh, older buildings do need more. So uh, these are important factors we take in trying to balance that need of new, of existing, of care dollars, which is part of the reason why uh, for primarily all, all of our, and as you saw in John's chart, the um, Pentacrest modernizations, which was the is the only request now pushed back till next year, but is the only request of the university on the capital plan because it is uh, because it's a big one. It's three buildings that are all at or over 100 years of age right at the core of the campus. And um, they become even in the capital asks we have our our emphasis and commitment is to deferred maintenance buy down and, and renewal costs on campus. Next slide. So uh, this, this slide is, is one that is common uh, throughout higher education. The chart that you see that says, what is the COVID impact uh, above it, gives a curve that is about the University of Iowa in comparison uh, where the blue line, the blue shaded mountains you see in that chart is the national university or peer average uh, working with um, working again with sight lines and assessing conditions and, and square footage added to the campus since 1880. And as you can see, the, the bumps in the curve are similar uh, across our nation uh, with the largest of those being after World War II and the, um, uh, the military uh, coming back um, and going to school and fast growth of campuses at that time. I think the most important thing to recognize is that we have not just that history, but that there is a, uh, as you can see in the lower lower left, there's annual stewardship, which is keep up case, uh, keep up costs, and then the catch up costs of asset reinvestment. And what we want to try to do is um, is balance that and make sure that our annual stewardship keeps up, that we hit a, a stacia of of care for our campus and don't fall behind the curve, because in general, buildings that are built to last and are on university campuses have a 30 to 40 year um, intermediate lifespan where 
major modernization needs, the way we teach, the way we do research, the way students interact with spaces combined with building systems, HVAC systems, plumbing systems, hit sort of a 30 to 40 year uh, a cadence of need. And so each time you see a spike on, on the historic chart, you can just move forward 30 or 40 years and know that issues of deferred maintenance and others escalate on, on that timing behind those. And it's a, it's a challenge all of us face in, in an aging campus and one that needs to be um, attending to students' needs in, in technology, in research, in teaching, in learning, um, because we, we, the students expect a lot and the way we teach uh, is expected to, to um, advantage them, as you can imagine. And, and yet you can also see very, very small indication of a downward arrow at the end of the blue line for the, uni for the University of Iowa. We are seeing downward trend following the 2008 uh, impacts and the things we did following the flood, um, our square footage is, is dropping. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we're proud of at the University of Iowa, and it helped in sealing our deal, if you will, with NG and Meridium in the uh, P3 for our utility system, was our hard pushing efforts on energy consumption and uh, attaining 0% coal uh, efforts on our campus have been constant. The chart to the left indicates um, net energy use on the campus. And despite a series of buildings uh, that you can see over a, over a um, uh, 10 and 20 year period, but this is 10 year period of buildings that were significant added to our campus, uh, we maintained and have maintained no energy use growth on this campus. It has been done through um, energy efficient systems and upgrades to those buildings as part of the deferred maintenance, but also use uh, and, and education on the campus. We've been proud of, of keeping that trajectory constant uh, since 2010. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be coal free by 2025. And and actually the intent uh, by NG is to elevate that to 2023. So uh, we'll um, continue pushing forward on that. And part of the reason it works is because of the aggressive efforts we've made in biofuels from oat holes to miscanthus to these um, green energy pallet, uh, green energy pellets. Um, we now COVID, as it said, COVID is, it's having an impact on all of us. Um, and, and we, we as, not to be too much like the utility, we, we, the, the hot coals have to be attended to. And certainly all ears are pinned back on, on issues related to uh, COVID, but we are still on track to go coal free and um, are, are, are proud not only of the work that all of our utilities folks did on this front, but how it enabled us to partner with uh, NG and Meridium, and, and that has been successful in its early going, and that effort will benefit our students uh, through the proceeds related to that, um, to that venture. Next slide. We are making good progress. As I mentioned, you're not expected to see the little words or the shapes up in the upper right, but it is an expression of our, of our planning process that we have developed over the last four to five years that really redesigned how we do master planning, how we engage in the shared governance process on this campus, how we use chartered committees most effectively, and then assess that balance of modernization, new facilities, uh, square footage shortages, but also where we can take advantage of what we have to uh, rid ourselves in effect of, of buildings that are aging, obsolete, and very costly. And to that end, um, you can see in the middle of the page on the, on the uh, left-hand side, um, this, uh, this has allowed us to put into planning, it's either in planning or executed, a series of projects that will raise these buildings, roughly 400,000 square feet of space uh, being raised from our campus, um, either uh, on the main campus, Oakdale, um, and on the Hawkeye campus, but you can see the list of them here. It includes, for instance, the um, communication center, which is on the main campus. It's the, uh, it's the picture on the left in the middle section of pictures. Uh, that building is no longer on our campus, uh, built in 1956 and was uh, original home to the Daily Iowan. 
or was the, the, when it was open, the Daily Iowan was there. It's now in the Adler Journalism Building, but um, we have taken that building down, and the one in the picture next to it is Seashore Hall. Um, Seashore Hall is 128,000 square feet that we have bid and uh, have actually begun to uh, stage the site probably in October. Second half of October, we'll begin taking that building down. But you can see the collection of buildings. It does include a couple of projects that are a little further out in the five within the five-year plan, West Lawn uh, on the west side of the campus and the Institute of uh, Rural Environmental Health, an outdated building on the Oakdale campus that is also planned. It, it takes, as you can imagine, the coordination in removing these buildings is primarily related to the programs that have to be removed uh, from those and put in fitting locations on campus. So none of them is a, is a small task and they're all part of a continuum of our assessing the buildings on our campus, where they stand, where we can put programs in the best places for research and for um, teaching our students. Next slide. Our renewed uh, approach it fits into some of the things that I've been talking about, the blue box to the blue box on this, um, uh, on, on this flow chart, if you will, but facility stewardship, our building conditions, how we look after maintenance, reinvestment, trying to work on uh, that always growing uh, backlog of deferred maintenance, and then commission, decommissioning, as the previous slide said, and getting rid of some of those old buildings that have substantial deferred maintenance. So when we see uh, deferred maintenance, it includes, for instance, seashore hall needs that will disappear when we rent it, when we raise that building. On the other side, uh, the facilities needs on our campus. And certainly COVID is challenging all, as it says, traditional educational delivery methods, including services related to that. Um, our, our office functions and others, many, I'm sitting in an, uh, you know, an almost empty Jessup Hall today as we are trying to decompress the campus for the students that are on campus. So a lot of the, if you will, uh, um, back of house functions on our campus are being addressed by people working from home and coordinating virtually or electronically as we are. And it is allowing us or forcing us to, um, to look ahead and look at innovative ways for the services to the campus to be address, but also teaching. Uh, we, we 75% of the classes this semester are online. Our course work time is online. So all of those matters you can see uh, listed here, collaboration online, remote work, multi uh, repurposing assets and mobile operations are all things we're, we were forced into and are experimenting with now. And, and these kinds of efforts and those modernizations lead to our uh, strategies on campus. And then yes, our capital requests, which have included technology up, upgrades, and as we mentioned, the Pentacrest modernization next year, but this year, the deferred maintenance needs on campus. Next slide. And so uh, maybe to your point, David, as we look at uh, deferred maintenance priorities, you're looking at a list of projects that do hit the top of our score sheet at the University of Iowa. These are ones that are uh, uh, most uh, in need. And by the way, um, uh, one you won't see here is one that is on our capital register because it's moved from this list to the execution stage with the capital register. I'll talk about that later. But you can see Carver Biomedical Research Building, CBRB, a uh, exhaust system replacement, Linquist Center, Eckstein Medical, uh, e EMRB, Chemistry Building, and the Pop John Business Building are the five buildings equaling roughly $8 million of needs that hit the top of our list by our score sheet and by the sight lines assessment of, of building condition. One that closely followed by the Iowa Memorial Union, theater building, Bowen Science and Med Lab projects. And you can see almost all those projects are building systems and building system fixes to make sure that the buildings continue to operate and we don't run into risks of uh, business interruption related to these very important buildings, about half of them lab buildings and the other half student buildings. And you can see the current deferred maintenance uh, log or backlog for the University of Iowa is greater than $400 million, no small number. And a part of 30 million obviously doesn't make that go away, but in our working with sight lines and our assessing these kinds of priorities, it allows us to um, reach an operational balance where um, uh, those working and learning on campus don't, um, don't recognize the, the challenges uh, of, of older facilities that we have. 
Next slide. One of the things that uh, John, uh, you wanted us to touch on, and it's certainly in the governance report or our campus road systems, University of Iowa by this map, which uh, does include, as you, as you can see, the research park um, and also McBride Recreational Center show uh, the in the red, the University of Iowa uh, maintained roadways, uh, 32.6 miles uh, throughout our campus. And because we are a, an urban campus, uh, some of the areas that you see don't have red lines, go straight through our campus, are city streets and or state because uh, highway, um, highway six also goes uh, through the campus. So IDOT spaces as well. Next slide. Related to the campus roads and our institutional roads uh, program. Um, uh, something to note here, of course, a, a couple of projects to note, uh, reconstruction and improvement of the Hawkeye Park Road, Melrose to Hawkeye Drive, that's on the Oakdale, or rather on the Hawkeye campus at the west, uh, far west end of our campus. And then the stretch of Hawkins Drive between Melrose and Evashevsky Drive, uh, kind of between Kinnick Stadium and um, University of Iowa hospitals and clinics are slated to be our primary um, uses of the funds made available to us through the IDOT. The, the, uh, there's always a, a big part of this being annual special maintenance and pavement management programs. Those are all often on much smaller sites and to take care of problems. I will say, I think if you go to the next slide, See if I just say it or if we've got um, this yeah it's a challenge for us you can see the assessment right now of that more than 30 miles um, 52 52 percent fair 14 percent uh, poor and 34 percent good with with the statistics you see below and by the way this accounts for all of the snow removal and the things that we do associated with our roadways making them safe for uh, pedestrians for cars for bikes for the emergency vehicles associated with UIHC. But uh, for comparison and something that does concern us, you can see the funding, $710,000 uh, um, per year for our 36 uh, lane miles we have, that, that equates to 19,000 per lane mile at the University of Iowa campus. Um, the Some concerns about reductions uh, due to the next two years for the road tax fund. But for comparison, a couple of other states, of course, there are you know, a lot of other states to compare to, but in Colorado and New Hampshire, two examples we're familiar with, their per mile uh, rate of investment and funding is in the over 50,000 a year. And when we're at 19,000, um, it's not unlike the building situation. We'll, we'll move quickly to fix problems, potholes, uh, settling, other things that occur, but at 19,000, the long in the long term, that blue piece of pie in that chart will grow, and the orange will become smaller. Next slide. It's a thank you. So we've already talked about uh, this. This slideshow on an annual basis typically also includes um, our ask, but John has covered that already. Uh, we will. Uh, come back to you and hopefully you to the state for our ask next year on the Pentecrest buildings, which continue to age at the very, very heart of our campus and a big part of our strategy for um, future years in teaching, especially, but teaching and research on our campus. But that's for another year. Uh, the ask has, uh, John has, uh, has um, uh, pointed that out and, and we're thankful for those funds if we're able to garner those and we'll make good use of those funds in deferred maintenance if we if we're able to garner those with that i'll stop and uh, either take questions or turn it to you john a quick question milt if that's okay that thanks uh rod would you be able to get us an estimate of your maintenance and utility costs sort of by age of building or, or broken down between old renovated and new space yeah, we can certainly, Regent Parker, we can we can assess that and give it, at least in general terms, every building, as you can imagine, building type and research versus service versus classroom are different. Right. But uh, I'd be glad to have our facilities management experts on that front um, provide us with a summary report on <clears throat> what happens to what happens to the cost of care of buildings as they get older. Yep, great. That's what you're looking for. Be glad to. Thank you. 
Other the questions? I'll say the answer is more. <laughs> it costs more. Yeah. Yeah. Regent, Regent Barker, I mean, anything that you would like to have, we will get to you. Okay. And any list that you can imagine, seriously, I mean, it's just sort of a, I mean, there's so much data and these folks are so good at mining that data and putting together reports quickly that it is not a problem to um, get you whatever you need as you go, because I know you get questions on things. And, and if you do, just let us know. That's great. Thank you very much. Other questions for Rod on the facilities report or his capital request? I had a question. Rod, do you recycle anything when you take the buildings down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do all of it. In, in fact, one of, one of the things that we have done for years, obviously, has been part of the LEAD, uh, Leadership in Inter Energy and Environmental Design um, Program. To some degree, we have, um, if you will, graduated from that. Our, our standards, our um, construction, demolition, um, design standards go uh, really above what LEED expects. Our typical buildings end up LEED gold just by following our standards, not by trying to achieve LEED. Um, and part of that is about not just recycling, and I think you're talking about the, the demolition projects, but also recycling in the construction, as you can imagine. Um, it, two by four comes in a 12 foot length and you need nine, what happened to the last three feet? Those kinds of things are things that we work with uh, contractors on who are building projects and uh, building information modeling, computer rendering of our design standards uh, allow for contractors to, to cut it the more efficient. On the, on the demolition side, one, usually we're taking down an old building. Now, I, there's, a big, there's always a debate about what's, what's old and what's historic. Uh, we are great keepers of history on this campus and, and heritage and where we invest in that We've done so with care and with knowledge and commitment. But when we end up with a building like uh, Seashore, which was built in 1899 as the first University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, and when we moved to the hospital across the river in 1928, since 1928, that building has been a hospital pretending to be a classroom and lab building, and it's been misfitted for that. Um, over the years, those changed a lot, but everything from doorknobs to window frames to other things, we allow uh, local historians and also recycling companies to work with the general contractor to, if you will, sc scrape through the building those matters. The contractors often sell a lot of the metal products on a second market, and those are recycled that way. And, um, and then uh, concrete and those, uh, as, as uh, Milt knows, concrete and other things are processed uh, for reuse in the construction industry. Uh, but inevitably there is some landfill, but we, we push our contractors hard for recycling. And that's from the historic and the economic green side. Rod, this is Jim Lindenmeyer. Uh, when you raise a building, do you do your own asbestos abatement or do you contract that out uh, with the raising? Yeah, so we have um, asbestos or environmental um, uh, managers on our, on, we have a team who looks after air quality and asbestos and those things because it comes up, as you can imagine, often on a campus of our scale. The work itself is done by contract. So for instance, Seashore Hall uh, and any of these projects I've mentioned have a, a preliminary contract, which is the clean out. That's, that's where asbestos is removed from those projects, from those buildings, and then the contractor comes in to do the work. They don't, they don't do them one in the same. Uh, so it's a two contract process for almost all of our demolitions. I see Other Patty. questions for Patty might, Patty might be asking a question. I think she's on mute. Sorry, I don't know how I got back on again. Um, has any, can you hear me now? You bet. Yes. Okay. Uh, ha, has there ever been any, in, any discussion about some kind of a deferred maintenance fund when buildings are being uh, thought about and uh, begin um, the work of building them? Um, because it's such a big deal for, to, it's so much money. Yeah. Um, to, for this deferred maintenance, has anybody uh, has anybody ever thought about that, let alone done it? 
So for all of our new buildings, new square footage on campus uh, and, and tied to our, um, our budget system that we have now, we, if you will, uh, apply a tax that goes to the campus and that means all of the, the funding parties, the colleges on our campus of uh, one and a half percent of the replacement cost. Now, if for instance, engineering builds a new building, um, that cost is not theirs because the costs needed to fix that engineering building or renew it or modernize it don't, don't come up for, as you can imagine, a number of years, it's a new building. But this ongoing march of age does occur on the campus. So when we collect that, all of the colleges pay into that uh, based on our CEA model uh, as, a, as a community member for additional square footage on our campus. Does not answer, it does not answer all of the questions for deferred maintenance, but it does provide us funding that helps us get to where we are now and being able to uh, modernize and renew buildings on campus. Hey, Rod, this is Bruce. Can you hear me? Yes. One thing we've, you and I have talked about, and I broached it several years ago with the board, is, you know, when we use that one and a half percent, it's assuming that either the deferred maintenance or the replacement cost is, has a life of about 66, 67 years. Um, said another way, 100 divided to replace the whole building at one and a half percent a year gets you to about 66 or 67. And I, I think the board would be well served to take a look at that. Um, because, for, for example, many of our buildings, while the structure itself might last, what goes on inside probably won't um, because of the technical obsolescence that's going on. Oops. Bruce, I think we just, lost, we just you. lost you a little bit. I hear, I don't hear you talking, but it's not on mute. <laughs> Hmm. Huh. It stopped mid sentence. Yeah. Well, Bruce, I, are you still there? Bruce, do we have you? He may not have us. Looks like he's not connected. Or I see you, Bruce. Now he's off again. One of the things Bruce is mentioning, of course, is uh, one and a half doesn't cover, you know. It, it, you spend a lot of money on buildings that get into the age of the buildings that we have, and um, uh, the costs would um, might might prevent um, projects from happening. With the, I mean, the one and a half percent is a, not is a noticeable number for a college that might be on one side of the river helping to fund um, the construction of another project on our campus uh, through that. But again, those costs that are collected for that one and a half percent don't go to that project. They go to the campus's need for updating. Uh, it's not uh, all that is needed and, and uh, more look at that, you know, eyes wide open as a building is, is conceived and, and is planned is important because we do see if we're intending to keep these buildings this long, how, how the costs of deferred maintenance can grow uh, decade over decade. And it's another reason why when finding an opportunity to take buildings like Seashore Hall at 128,000 square feet or the communication center down and not impact university um, functions, teaching and research, uh, to do that takes, a, a, you know, one by one, a big load off of, off of our deferred maintenance, um, deferred maintenance burden. So I'm sorry, I had a, a mess. Um, I had to log off and come back on. Where I was headed was saying that one and a half percent may not be the right number, may, may need to be much higher than that, particularly, and by the way, across the university, one and a half for everything also doesn't make sense to me. It may need to be higher in a lot of our labs and in the medical arena than it is in other parts of the campus. So we might wanna, the board could be well, I, I think we're continually under-reserving Regent County is, is, is the net of all that. It, we don't have depreciation per se, as a business would. We have this account of one and a half percent and that troubles me. Thank you. Other questions for Rod and University of Iowa? 
Okay, thanks, Rod. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. Uh, uh, we will move on now to Paul and Iowa State. Well, Chairman Dokovich, Board of Committee members, good afternoon. Certainly appreciate the opportunity today to uh, present to you our facilities governance report and our institutional road program. Next slide, please. Start out with some trends, uh, looking at relative to uh, university enrollment over time, relative to our building inventory. Of course, our enrollment's been dropping for the past few years, but over the past 10 years, uh, enrollment's still up. 19 percent and this is in full-time equivalents not necessarily headcount but relative to that over the same period our total building inventory has grown about 11 percent and if you look at the subset of just academic research and administrative facilities we've gone up about eight percent so we necessarily haven't overshot our uh, enrollment growth over the past several years uh, next slide please Looking now at uh, our classroom and teaching laboratories, again, the trend of the inventory over time, you can see our classroom inventory really has been pretty stable over the past 10 years, despite that enrollment growth. Uh, most of the growth that we've had in the buildings we've put up over the past 10 years has been in teaching labs. Uh, and it doesn't include the research labs, of course, this is just the teaching laboratories. You can see that's, that's grown significantly over time. And then how are we utilizing that space? What this graph here on the right is, is a combination of the two uh, classroom and lab utilization goals that we have. So in terms of seats, we try to occupy on average 67% of the seats in a classroom over the course of a, a week. And then we try to use that classroom at least 30 hours a week out of 45. I know that doesn't sound like much when you do, with, but when you do classroom scheduling, if you can push those numbers, that's, that's a pretty good achievement. Uh, you can see we have a whole lot of change from last year. We're running about 39% right now for the classrooms in terms of weekly seat hours. If you combine those two metrics, and then 17% uh, for the individual teaching labs, which probably just continue, which is not different from the past, but uh, probably reflects a flat with the Iowa State University of Science and Technology, given the diversity of our uh, STEM programs here on campus. A lot of our labs don't lend to sharing between programs. Next slide, please. Uh, as Rod was getting at, we do have an age distribution with our uh, facility inventory, and this is just focusing in on the academic research and administrative buildings, showing you how over time our current inventory was built. Uh, our average years, our average age is a little lower, 48 years than what uh, Rod presented. Uh, the renovated age, as Rod mentions, if you do a major renovation on building, you can reset that building age. For us, a good example of that was what was done here from Marston Hall several years ago. Uh, hasn't come down a whole lot, but uh, as he was describing, you get to a certain age and major building systems and components come due for repair and replacement. You know, the roof, the uh, heating and cooling system, the electrical system, the lighting does have a life cycle and does have a replacement component. Uh, and as you can at the, see at the bottom there, we've got about 70% of our inventory now, which has gone over that threshold in terms of need of major uh, repair and replacement of building components. Next slide, please. So what that has resulted in, of course, is a steadily growing backlog of maintenance and repairs here at uh, Iowa State University. Uh, got three trends here over time. On top there is our general university buildings, the academic research and administrative facilities. Uh, we have uh, reported at the end of fiscal year 20, uh, backlog now just over half a billion dollars uh, in those facilities. And you can barely see at the bottom there uh, what the amount of money we'd get to put toward that in, in any given year, obviously not keeping up with that growing requirement. A little better news story there in the lower left, that's our backlog of fire safety deficiencies, items identified by the fire, fire, uh, state fire marshal for correction. Uh, we do put a higher priority on that and we do steadily put resources toward that. And uh, we are successfully driving that number down over time. Not that it's static, every, new, every year some new stuff comes up but we haven't keeping up with working back down. And then lastly, in the lower right, uh, our utility system, which is an independent auxiliary enterprise. We have been able to keep that uh, backlog under control by building the proper maintenance, repair, and renewal requirements into our rates. Uh, you'll see a little growth there from fiscal year 17 to 19. 
that was really attributable to uh, some assessment work we did in our plant in preparation for a major project which we have underway now to upgrade the main power system in the plant. Uh, the board approved that earlier this year. That project is now underway and uh, we'll be executing that over the next few years as we get the work phased in because we certainly can't take the entire system down at once. But we're able to budget that money in our current operating budget. So uh, that, that will not be an issue for us. Uh, next slide, please. Talk a little more about where that general fund or academic research administrative facility backlog is in terms of the buildings. And kind of going back to the need to replace uh, facility systems and components at the end of their useful life. That's what you're seeing there on the left. The amount of backlog across our buildings, which is in our heating and cooling systems, our building electrical, the building plumbing, and the other categories you see there, uh, that's exterior windows and doors. So when you kind of look at the building exterior, you take that, the uh, roofs, the other exterior shell, and that's quite a requirement to keep the weather out and keep the uh, place warm and dry. Uh, elevators, of course, constant challenge. Uh, as Pam mentioned, we do keep a, a running priority on this. Uh, our, our team here in facilities basically keeps a running top 10 in each of these categories. What are the top 10 needs uh, in individual buildings in these areas? And that's what we'll bring forward to our maintenance improvement committee here on campus with representatives from the various divisions to uh, agree on university-wide priorities. Uh, you'll see there the list of projects that we uh, submitted to the board office to support the $30 million request to the state, uh, $12 million. And I think if you just kind of scan the titles there, you'll see a nice alignment between uh, that and the various categories there on the left. Nothing very glamorous, as, as Rod talked about, roof, air handling units, exterior, chill water, domestic water, line replacement, just the basics, the highest priority requirements we've got in every one of those areas. And unfortunately, these are systems which have gotten to the point where they are failing, and they are breaking down, and we're putting a lot of reactive uh, emergency repair and maintenance into it uh, to keep things going. Uh, obviously, uh, we're not going to really do a nice job or frankly, an adequate job of keeping up with a half billion dollar backlog at you know, roughly a million dollars a project. The projects are important, we gotta do them, but uh, we're really just nibbling on the edges. So in response to that, last year, uh, we started the development here of what we call a strategic facilities plan. Uh, think of it as a kind of a bottom up, zero based budget approach. We are literally determining uh, our university facility requirements, calculating how many square, fit we, square feet we need by the type of space, academic, classrooms, offices, research, uh, by academic programs. So we're looking at it college by college, research requirements, support, student support, and administrative or logistical support requirements. So we will have a, a square foot requirement for the university. Uh, we are comparing that. Uh, to an assessment of our existing facilities, both the quantity and quality of those facilities, uh, seeing if we do have shortfalls, as we know we do, in terms of adequate facilities to keep up with our requirements, and perhaps some surpluses in some areas. Uh, and then based on that, we're going to uh, determine and prioritize projects to, uh, uh, on a larger scale to address these shortfalls uh, with a real emphasis on renewal and recapitalization rather than perhaps new construction. As I mentioned, we started this last year. Uh, the schedule did have to slip to some extent because of the pandemic, just both uh, you know, trying to do work virtually, plus the fact that uh, most of the campus leadership has been tied up in planning to uh, reopen the campus this fall. But we're working toward completing this by next summer and hopefully be able to give you a presentation on it sometime this summer. Next slide, please. We're also asked, although it's not part of necessarily the governance report, uh, to give you a little update on our building demolition over the past several years. So here's a 10 year look back at what we have demolished over time. Uh, to date, 168,000 square feet. And along with that, eliminating $16.5 million worth of backlog. In addition, we have uh, funded projects either under design, under design or already under contract to another to do another 50, 56,000 square feet, which will take us up to about a quarter million square feet uh, taken out taken out of service, uh, eliminating just under 
$20 million worth of uh, deferred maintenance backlog. In addition, of course, there's annual savings going forward. Uh, we estimate that to be about $2.6 million a year of savings forever uh, that, uh, that we don't need to put in these buildings. Uh, the picture there is one of our more recent demolitions came down this year, the insectary building, uh, which uh, is on Pamel Drive, just west of the new Advanced Technology and Research Building Laboratory building. Uh, that building dates actually from 1928. So uh, some fond memories for the people that were in it. I got a faculty member who lives next door to me who misses it greatly, but uh, uh, from a facility standpoint, and even I think from his standpoint, he's working in a much better facility. Than that. Next slide, please. An overview of our institutional road program. We receive uh, just under $900,000 a year to go toward the maintenance, repair, and reconstruction of 46 miles of roads and bridges here on campus. Uh, we're pretty interwoven with the city of Ames in terms of our road network. As you can see, the bulk of the money does go toward recurring road maintenance, overlays, repairs. Again, nothing glamorous, but responding to the needs on campus. We do have two reconstruction projects planned, one for Shoal Road, if you know the Ames area, that's the road that goes out toward our Applied Science Complex complex off Ontario Road, and then 13th Street, which is a major east-west artery across the city and across campus. This is the portion of the road that we own. Uh, we're looking to do a major work there. And we've programmed in recently uh, several signal, traffic signal replacements, uh, both uh, existing signals and putting in some new signals, doing one, as you see noted there, in cooperation with the city of Ames because we own a couple of streets and they own a couple of streets, so we're going to share the cost. Um, next slide, please. And of course, we've deferred uh, the request for additional state funded capital projects to the next fiscal year, but thought I'd take the opportunity to bring you up to date on two, our two current state funded projects. First, the Student Innovation Center uh, has been completed, it was completed this previous spring. Uh, and just in time, we certainly needed it. The picture there is literally of the first class for the first hour of the first day of the fall semester. That is not intended to be a classroom. That was supposed to be a fabrication shop. But uh, when we reduce our campus capacity here to 50% occupancy of our classrooms, we face a real shortfall in big rooms where we can do bigger classes. So we actually held off outfitting three class, two, three shop areas in the Student Innovation Center and, and now scheduled classrooms in them. Uh, the second project, our veterinary diagnostic lab project, which is funding replacing about half of the existing uh, VDL in the vet med school, uh, really for the front end components of the VDL. That is under solicitation right now. We received uh, proposals from our final three firms. We are evaluating those proposals. We'll be making a contract award next month and look toward a summer 23, 23 completion. And I believe that's all. Next slide, please. So subject to any of your questions, that concludes uh, the presentation. Questions for Paul on Iowa State University. Um, I had one, well, first of all, congratulations on that, uh, the uh, fire safety deficiency uh, decline. That was a very impressive uh, slide, I thought. Um, on the $504 million in deferred maintenance, I'm curious, is that the sum of projects that you could initiate now, or does that include depreciation on things? So projects that you would do in the future? Does that make that sense? That is the sum of all the repair and replacement of facility components that should have been done on their life cycle. So okay. that is all, for lack of better words, perhaps past sins. That is an accumulated backlog of work that we should have done. Okay, so that does not include at all that you've got a roof that is, you know, 50% appreciated and will have to be done at some point. That's not. Not, not okay. at all, that is not looking for at all. Okay, got it, thank you. Other questions on Iowa State? Um, I have one, Patty. Um, yeah. Can, can you explain the usage of various labs? Uh, it seemed to me when you were at the very beginning, it seemed like not very many of the labs were being used a lot. Uh, did I mishear or misunderstand? 
No, you correctly noted that. Our, our lab utilization here is generally low. Uh, and that is, yes, uh, compared to the, to the goals we should be achieving. Uh, and that's interesting, because as I mentioned, we're under uh, way with developing a strategic facility plan and taking a look at requirements. And when we sat down uh, and, and actually calculated out you know, our, our teaching lab requirements, how many students, how many sections, uh, for each individual program that requires labs, uh, we actually came up with more square feet than we have today, which was a counterintuitive uh, uh, answer. And uh, like I said, I think what, what we're seeing here, given that we have such a significant STEM program, both in our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, College of Engineering, College of Agricultural Life Sciences, each of those programs and all those departments have individual labs supporting those academic programs. And the ability to share those labs across programs, like we do with our general university classrooms, is fairly limited. So a civil engineering laboratory is not going to be used for a wet lab for chemistry. It is not going to be used for a, 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 you know, a, a biology lab either. So I think what we've seen over time is when you need the lab, you need it. But given the number of programs that we have needing lab space, we can't achieve the same efficiency of use as we are generally using classrooms. Okay, so is there a plan? Yes, as I said, we are working through that as part of this facilities plan and taking a hard look at that number and taking a hard look at those lab requirements. For sure, they tie up space. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for Paul? Hearing no more, thanks. Very much, Hello. Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on to Mike Zwanziger, University of Northern Iowa. Regent Djokovic, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Uh, to start with, I will uh, summarize our FY20 facilities governance report. Next slide. Brock, next slide, please. So UNI is comprised up of about 810 land acres uh, that's broken down into the uses that uh, are described in, the, in this slide here, where the red indicates academic, which is much more at the core with some uh, student services areas uh, right in that area as well. Uh, of note that over the past five years, we've sold 100 acres of property, uh, shrinking our inventory by 10%. Next slide. The overall footprint of the university uh, for buildings is just over 4.7 million gross square feet with 68 buildings over 10,000 gross square feet, which is how we classify what a major building would be. Uh, general fund buildings uh, comprise almost 55% of this space with a replacement value of over 1.2 billion. Next slide. So similar to what uh, uh, Rod showed, showed earlier, um, this shows the age profile of both uh, universities general fund and department of residence spaces uh, buildings. Uh, the gold represents department of residence and the blue would be general fund. Uh, of, similar to what, uh, again, you've seen um, uh, Rod's slide and what Paul alluded to is that 36% of the general fund space at UNI's campus and 58% of the department of residence space is between 40 and 60 years old. Here at UNI, that, uh, that corresponds to a conversion from a teacher's college into a comprehensive uh, residential university, and it represents about half of the value of the buildings on campus. Uh, as it was also mentioned, uh, that's important because most of the life expectancy of building systems uh, is somewhere between 25 and 40 years old. I think Rod used 30 to 40, and uh, Paul had talked about 25 to 40 in there. And so a lot of those spaces need to be renewed. A lot of the systems need to be uh, renewed. And that's resulted in our deferred maintenance climbing as we had a significant amount of building growth uh, between 1965 and 1970 in that time period. Those buildings are getting close, getting to 50 years old um, and need some pretty significant attention. Next slide, please. Through a lot of the focus that we've had on renovations, we've moved the age profile uh, forward in our general fund spaces. And we're working with Department of Residence and the Athletic Department to develop a plan to address their aging facilities. 
So just kind of as a comparison here, if you could take a look at the blue, blue graph and Brock, if you could move back to the previous slide and focus on the blue graph and move back forward. So through renovations, we've kind of reset the age of several buildings to, to indicate that, um, you know, we have a new renewal period for several buildings that are between 2000 and 2010 that reset the life of those. So we've got 15 to 25 years before we get uh, significantly into those buildings again. Okay, uh, next slide. We have two committees on campus that help us make some decisions on facilities. One is the Facilities Planning Advisory Committee. That's an accident advisory capacity to our senior leadership team on a variety of issues, uh, including master planning, uh, capital planning, land and space use. And the other is our building repair committee that prioritizes repairs and deferred maintenance needs uh, to help us allocate funds. Next slide. So as a part of those, those committees specifically like in building repair, uh, Regent Barker, you had indicated about some of the um, projects we would do if we received some deferred maintenance money. And we do have a list and our list is very similar to uh, the one that the University of Iowa and Iowa State had very much focused on uh, building envelope roofs HVAC improvements, uh, uh, we have an elevator in one of ours. So uh, again, we're all very, very similar circumstances where we have a lot of those systems that need to be updated. Some of the recent improvements that have been uh, made on University of Northern Iowa's campus is the Nielsen Fieldhouse. Um, we had space in this facility uh, with the closure of Price Lab School that was in poor condition and underutilized. Uh, that space was uh, renovated for UNI's military science and ROTC programs and to, to a lesser degree for our child development center. All these spaces are now occupied and an opportunity for uh, increased enrollment in our military science program. Next slide. We also modernized the original 1932 shops building, which sits on central campus uh, for our ad new admissions welcome center and that's uh, in order to enhance the experience for, for prospective students and parents. And this is open and operating as well. Next slide. Uh, one uh, Department of Residence one I wanted to highlight is uh, to address some of the student housing needs. We've updated Dancer Hall with more privacy in the showers, ADA compliant accommodations, uh, updated public areas and converted them to single occupancy rooms. Uh, this facility was originally constructed in 1969 and had minimal updates prior to this project. Uh, and currently we have floors uh, one through eight occupied and nine through 12 will be ready here in the next couple weeks. Next slide. So overall our deferred maintenance liability has increased to a little over $200 million in FY20. And that deferred maintenance is for UNI's inventory of buildings that has a replacement value of 1.2 billion. Uh, in addition to the projects that we undertake to address deferred maintenance, uh, we've also reduced our general fund footprint by over 190,000 gross square feet since 2014. And last year, Department of Residents removed Hillside Courts Apartments, reducing their inventory by over 200,000 gross square feet. So that removal of almost 400,000 gross square feet uh, eliminated tens of millions of dollars worth of deferred maintenance liability and, and allowed us to focus on some of the newer uh, maybe more critical spaces on campus to maintain. Next slide. So um, we continue to reduce our energy usage through uh, recommissioning and uh, scheduling efforts through our energy management and utilities area. In FY20, we were again able to reduce the amount of electricity and steam we used across campus. We've seen a steady improvement in the efficiencies and uh, we've been able to reduce the building utility consumption per gross square feet from 182 kilo BTUs per square foot in 2010 to 140 kilo BTUs per square foot in FY20. So in 10 years, we reduced it by about 25%. Next slide. Uh, so the next portion of this talks about institutional roads for 2021 through 2025. Next slide. So uh, UNI's Institutional Roads Program typically focuses on replacing and repairing roads in poor condition. Uh, the expected allocation for 2021 is estimated to be 436,000, although we're aware that that may, may change. Next slide. 
This map uh, highlights the Institutional Roads five-year plan for UNI. The uh, 2021 projects are shown in green and include a section of Nebraska Street, which is at the uh, north side of the, the page, top of the page, um, a section of CEEE Drive, which is more towards the south, and then lighting along Jennings Drive, which is along the south side. Next page. Um, so this is an example of one of the roads we're reconstructing. This is Nebraska Street. It's 150 foot of pavement, and this would be a complete reconstruction project. Uh, next slide. C Tripoli Drive is in a very similar condition where it's been patched and, and needs a complete reconstruction. And then next slide. Uh, this is the uh, next slide, please, there. This is the last section of Jennings Drive that needs to have upgraded lighting. Uh, the wiring in this section of, of lighting is in poor condition and will be replaced to minimize the chances of failure. And uh, highlighted here is we have some uh, uh, inefficient and less reliable metal halide fixtures and we'll re be replacing them with more efficient LED fixtures and the new wiring will uh, minimize any of the outages we would generally have in this area. Uh, so next slide is really the questions. Um, kind of blew through that kind of fast, but maybe you guys, we can get back on track. Uh, any no. questions for me? Mike, did you want to touch at all on the Learning Commons, your capital request? Um, you know, that's one where we're, we're, we obviously uh, switched up here a few years back and uh, we're able to get the Industrial Tech Center as our top priority. Um, so on that one, we are uh, still in the process of working on design on that one. Um, and that's being funded over the four, four year period. So for the Learning Commons, uh, we're trying to get that figured out on central campus um, and how we can enhance the student experience, uh, maybe looking at, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the way students are needing to learn now, it's much more virtual. There's a lot more electronic resources, a lot more different types of support that they need to be able to maybe do research, uh, present, uh, get get information from people and out to people. And so we're, we're still, uh, we know we want to, to do that really focused in our library. And uh, we've got a study that showed us a lot of what we want to do. But as things change, uh, you know, we, we may have to be rethinking some of that, to be quite honest. Okay. Uh, questions for Mike, you and I. Okay, hearing none, thanks very much. Uh, Iowa School for the Deaf is next. John Nash, were you going to take that? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Brock, if you'll put that slide up for ISD, please. So, uh, thank you, Regent Dokovich. Uh, John Cool wasn't able to be here today, so I told him that I would take a stab at it. Uh, next slide, please. So, after the long haul renovation, and long haul is ISD's high school, after that renovation, which has been funded by the legislature, <clears throat> and that project will be done in August of 2022, uh, ISD will have $1.5 million in deferred maintenance. And I know that we're talking a lot about deferred maintenance today, so I apologize. I'm a, I'm a little bit preoccupied with, with it, and it has kind of become the theme of this, this year's report. Um, but um, so yeah, $1.5 million in deferred maintenance for ISD, and they're facilities as, as it's done on all the other, at the other institutions, those facilities are inspected roughly about every two years, exactly, actually, let's just say every two years by the uh, State of Iowa Fire Marshal's Office and usually with the local fire department. So the City of Council Bluff, City of Council Bluffs works with the uh, Fire Marshal's Office to carry out those inspections. Um, so like for Iowa State, for example, Iowa State um, Environmental Health and, um, and Safety, their agency there has been kind of deputized to be able to carry out their, their fire inspections, their life safety inspections and environmental inspections. But uh, next slide, please. Um, appropriations, I guess I mentioned the appropriations. I guess I did not mention the appropriations, but for long haul, um, they've been get, they've received two appropriations, one for three million, one for 1.25 million to renovate uh, renovate that building, and that is going to involve the usual things of improving classrooms and uh, basically updating HVAC systems, electrical systems, and lighting. So, uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of the insides of the building would be updated. 
Um, that project alone would remove $2.2 million in deferred maintenance from their books. Uh, and Iowa State University's facility planning and management oversees all the projects, both at ISD and at the Braille School. Next slide, please. And the schedule for long haul is um, showing the appropriations there. The project construction itself would start in March of 21 and it would be complete in August of 22. Next slide, please. And the last slide is about the Braille School. Um, and I think most of you folks know this, but <clears throat> it's, uh, it's 11 buildings, 48 acres, and the, the sale of the Braille School uh, was closed on on August 27th this year. And by just doing that and by selling that property, we eliminate $1.3 million in deferred maintenance. And that now goes to the city of Vinton. Um, and then just yesterday, the AmeriCorps lease transferred to the city of Vinton, which was a, also a big moving part in this whole thing. Um, it's one thing to sell the property. It's the other thing to get the AmeriCorps to transfer that lease from us to the city of Vinton uh, as well. So um, AmeriCorps will keep leasing that property 60% of the Braille School until June of 2029. Next slide. Oh, I guess that's it. I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions for John on ISD. Okay, hearing none. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, Marion Johnson, uh, Iowa Public Radio, please. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, I can be pretty quick. I know you're running a little bit um, late on time. So um, let me, next slide, um, let me just give you a quick overview. Um, Iowa Public Radio was formed in 2004 to manage the stations owned by Iowa State, um, U of I, and the University of Northern Iowa. Um, and there are 26 stations um, that we manage for the universities. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a map which uh, I've shared with you in the past of the 26 stations. The dotted lines are our AM stations. Those are news stations. Um, the green stations are News and Studio One, and the red ones are our classical stations. So we have three separate services uh, across the state. Uh, next slide. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the infrastructure uh, involved in the public radio system owned by the universities, um, there are, uh, as I said, 26 stations. There's nine, Iowa State owns nine full service stations. UNI owns eight full service and six translator stations, and the University of Iowa owns two full service stations uh, and, a, and a translator. Um, they are located on towers either owned by or leased by the universities, um, as I'm in, you can see here the breakdown of, of those that are owned or leased by the universities. Um, and in addition, um, the stations occupy space on each of the university campuses. Next slide. Um, the aging infrastructure, um, deferred maintenance, once again, just to give you a sense of, uh, of what we have uh, in terms of aging infrastructure. Um, seven of the 26 main transmitters on the university stations are now living beyond their life of 15 years. I've listed them here. Um, the total value of uh, replacing them would be in the $2 million range. Um, our goal is to replace transmitters at 15 years and to move the replaced transmitters then to backup status. Um, and, uh, and then that backup transmitter is fully retired. Um, we also have a couple of transmission lines um, that need to be replaced. Um, and uh, I can tell you more about them in the next two slides. Um, the WOIFM transmitter, transmission line and antenna, um, as I mentioned, the transmitter is 25 years old um, and the transmission line is obsolete. The replacement parts are no longer manufactured. Um, we did a, a significant repair on the station last year, replacing the transformer. Um, the station was uh, on backup for a couple of weeks until we could replace that transformer. Um, so, and we would also need to be replacing the antenna there. Next slide. And then the KSUI FM transmission line, once again, um, some of you have seen these slides before. Um, there was uh, some water infiltration in that uh, transmission line. 
Um, so this is a picture of a, a guy from a tower crew who came out and uh, took it apart and dried it and put it back together. Um, that was in 2015. Um, it's still it's still running, but it does need to re be replaced. The line has been compromised, and so um, it needs to be replaced. Uh, next slide. Um, and then just to give you a sense, um, we typically invest about $350,000 per year in repairs, maintenance, and capital. Um, and these can you know, range from things like that transformer for the WOIF trans, uh, FM transmitter to um, STL dishes and things like that. So a variety of smaller uh, dollar items we uh, manage to handle every year uh, through Iowa Public Radio. And uh, that's that's it. Do you have any questions for me? Questions on Iowa Public Radio. Okay, hearing none. Thanks very much for that report. Thank you. Register at University of Iowa Capital Improvement Business Transactions, Rod Leonards. Thank you, Regent Dokovich. Uh, one item uh, for this board meeting and for the board to consider. Uh, English philosophy, English philosophy building EPB. It's a window replacement project. This will over two summers, next summer and the following summer, replace all of the windows, sealants, external uh, panels, uh, including the um, shade systems in each of the um, in each of the rooms. It's a two point one five million dollar project uh, paid for through building renewal as a as a deferred maintenance need on our campus. And uh, this is a request for project description and budget, allowing us to move forward with the um, construction, the design, the construction documents, and, and then bid this again to be delivered um, over the course of two summers, next summer and the following. Questions, comments? Okay, hearing none, that will be approved. <clears throat> Approved by the committee by consent. Oh, I'd also like to I also like to back up and uh, note that the facilities reports that were given have also been would also be approved by the by the committee by the consent by con, by consent to be presented to the full board. Thanks very much, Rod. Certainly. Uh, University of Iowa proposed acceptance of real estate gift and property sale. David Kep. Thank you, Regent Dokovich. Um, we're, the University of Iowa was uh, requesting approval from the board to uh, accept uh, approximately 39 acres of, of land uh, in Louisa County from the estate of Wald, Wallace Feldman, and then immediately approving the, uh, the sale of that same property to Oscar Hiller. Um, this is property that's in a very rural area of Louisa County, about 45 miles uh, from uh, the main campus of the University of Iowa certainly appreciative of the gift, but the university doesn't have a, a need to, to use the property. It doesn't fit into our academic or, or research mission. Uh, the property is in very poor shape. The home has been, it's an old farmhouse abandoned about 20 years ago, missing windows, um, more raccoons in it than, than you can imagine. There's um, about 15 vehicles, large dump trucks that are completely rusted out with trees growing through them. Um, so it, the property is in, in poor shape. The, the assessed value is only about 56,000. It's not really residential. It's not um, agriculture. It's sort of pristine woodlands. There's a pond and wetlands on it. It's uh, certainly a, a nice looking uh, natural piece of property. Um, I think it would be difficult to, to sell it on the market to uh, the open market. There's just not a lot of buyers for this type of, of property, especially given the condition of the of the property and, and what um, what we need to be done to, to bring it up to, to any sort of condition. Uh, the attorney for the estate uh, approached us and let us know there was a, an old family friend in Kentucky who was interested in buying the property as is with no contingencies, um, leaving everything sort of as is and and um, uh, he, his intent is to to keep it as a preserved uh, um, natural habitat for wildlife in the area. And so after some uh, back and forth negotiating, uh, we've settled on a price of 168,000, done due diligence on comparable sales in the area. Doesn't really fit again into that either agriculture or residential, um, but we're very comfortable with this price. 
uh, as the condition of the property stands right now is a significant um, liability risk to the university. And I think uh, uh, transferring this out of the university's name uh, at this point is a, is a uh, very smart thing to do and, and we're comfortable with the, the price uh, that's being offered. A uh, question for David questions. on this property. Yes, What's that? Uh, Milt, you bet. Um, are we getting rent from the raccoons? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and uh, as, as well as all the trespassers. When I went down there, I, I was concerned about what I was going to find. I, I had my cell phone close at hand uh, the entire time I was. <laughs> Could I was, be uh, creepy. You know, people have been accessing the property, and, and no yeah. one's been authorized for years to access it. So. I'm sure there's been some some uh, illicit things occurring down there. Yeah. Uh, so cell phone close at hand, David. N no cell service, but yeah. <laughs> cell phone close at uh, uh, hand. Uh, uh, that is that is correct. I'm sorry. So you did not do a formal appraisal, but you did look at comps for hunting land and that sort of thing. I exactly. I've got I've got volumes of of comparables. We probably have looked at 20 land sales in Louisa County over the last you know two years, and we're very comfortable with the price per acre. Okay. Other questions for David? Okay, hearing none, that will be a, approved by consent and submitted to the full board. Thanks very much. Thank you. David, for that report. Uh, moving on to the Register of Iowa State University Capital Improvement Business Transactions. Pam Kane, please. Thank you, Regent Dockovich and members of the committee. Uh, today, the Iowa State University has five different projects we want to um, Put in for your approval. The first one is permission to proceed with project planning, and that's to convert, remodel, and improve the bathrooms for more private and accessible spaces and to reduce energy. Both of the halls, uh, Friday Residence Hall and Helder Residence Hall, are popular student housing because of their location on campus and were constructed over numerous years. Friday, for example, was constructed between 1927, different parts of it, through 1984. And Helder Hall was constructed between 1957 and 1963. Um, and for both of those buildings, with these improvements and changes, the operating and maintenance costs did not substantially change. So for um, Friley Hall, the bathroom improvements are $17 million. And for Helder Hall, the bathroom improvements are $10 million. And that will include um, that one's design uh, professional selection. And I'll move on to our um, schematic design request for approval. And that is Hilton Coliseum um, to keep this project moving forward. And this is only for schematic design. It's not for project budget and, um, for construction. So it is only for the North and um, South Concourse expansion schematic design. And it is in two parts. Um, part of it, 60% of the cost related to uh, this project are for deferred maintenance of the HVAC system. And with the uh, improvements, it'll become more efficient. It'll have better lighting, which will be a combination of LED and daylighting, and will provide better environmental air quality with the upgraded um, systems. And the second part then is to expand the north and south walls to add more concourse floor space to help with fan circulation and for concession areas. There has already been $4 million um, of donor money pledged to this project. The third, the fourth project is for a revised uh, budget, and that's for the Student Innovation Center that was on um, Paul's list today that it's, it's substantially done, but we need a project budget increase of $1.9 million, which is about a 2.3 increase over the original budget of 84 million. Um, and the Student Innovation Center is a university community resource for collaboration, creativity, and innovation with unique state-of-the-art fabrications, assembly, and testing equipment to build prototypes of new products and new services. Everything from culinary to lunar, the digital to wood and metal, as well as entrepreneurship to vehicles. And the selection of audiovisual technology equipment was not completed when the building was designed and bid. The AV technology needs to support the vast array of programs being offered in this building. And the technology has been selected for the Stepatorium, which is a, a new word for me. It's not something in my vocabulary, but a Stepatorium where they can put the classes. If you've seen the building, it's, 
it's pretty interesting structure. It's pretty cool. Um, but it's also for team-based learning classrooms, uh, the media production suite, as well as the engineering capstone project suites. And so that increase to the budget, like you said, is about $1.9 million. And the last project is, an, is also a budget increase for the um, Iowa State University Kent Corporation Seed Mill and Brain Science Complex. The original project um, was $24 million. Uh, this increase, our, the original project budget was $21.2 million, and we're asking for a $24 million project budget, which is a $2.8 million increase or a 13.2% increase. Um, the project addresses significant needs of the Iowa agricultural industries. Um, unfortunately, the competitive proposals that came in exceeded the project estimate. Uh, there has been a lot of work done on the scope of the project. It has been reduced and um, there was a proposed standalone educational facility that was eliminated in the scope. And so um, therefore uh, we have worked very, very hard to, to get that project as, as low as we can and still accomplish the, the project needs. Um, the original budget of the 21.2 million was all from private donors. This increase of about $2.8 million will be funded through the university. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments for Pam? Uh, I'd want Pam on the uh, Hilton Coliseum. Um, you know, I think that's been postponed a couple of times because we wanted to see how the athletic situation uh, developed. Uh, do you feel that that situation has improved enough to uh, uh, warrant uh, moving forward? Well, I think we can move forward with the donor money that was intended for that building to keep it in, in moving forward. Um, I'm hoping that next year is a better year for um, sports, I think. Um, but um, we're always positive. We're always um, hoping for the best. And, you know, we're hoping that we'll have stand fans in the stands for our next football game. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. But but this is just, I mean, we can do that within the $4 million that's already been provided for this project. Thank you. Other questions? This is Sherry. Uh, oh, excuse me. Did somebody else say something? Okay. Yeah, Pam, on the Student Innovation Center, with the audio visual, how long will that take to uh, process, to set up? Um, that I'm not totally sure of the timing on that, um, okay. but I think the, if the equipment has been identified for what we need, and that's why we, we have an idea of what the project budget is. So, um, and it's only for those, the, the, the areas that I have talked about was the stepatorium, the team-based learning classroom, the media suite, and the engineering classroom. So it's for those four areas. So we have identified what equipment we now need. Okay. So it, I don't know um, the timing on, on how soon that would get in. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, this is Nancy Dunkel. And I had a question on your innovation center. When I look at the project budget, the new one that's being presented today. So uh, the revised budget, of course, is uh, moved up to 85 million, but the contingency went from 2.3 to 987,000. And that's because you've already dipped into the contingency. You've used some of that or? That, that is correct. We have used some of that contingency for the project. And so that the contingency is there for things that we are not aware of when we build that, build a building. So those um, can get used over the course of the construction. And so yes, the contingency changed because we have used some of that. Otherwise, if we hadn't used that contingency, we wouldn't need to increase the budget to, 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 for that technology, the AV equipment. And we could have used the, the contingency for that, but there were other things that came up and some of the changes that happened in the programming of that building. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, hearing none, that will be accepted by consent and submitted to the full board. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you. So, registered University of Northern Iowa Capital Improvement Business Transactions, Michael Hager, please. Thank you, Regent Dr. Vitch and committee members. 
Uh, at the end of last year, the board approved permission to proceed with planning for the Industrial Technology Center modernization project. And then earlier this year, the legislature provided the majority of the funding for that project as well. Um, as we've begun planning, uh, we'd like to ask permission for an option to use construction manager at risk as a delivery method. There's, there's three different reasons we think this might be helpful. The first is budget. Uh, we think the budget can be stretched further. We found that with Schindler Education Center when we use construction manager at risk. On that project, originally only four of the six floors were going to be finished, but the construction manager helped us find ways uh, to on that project to get all six floors renovated. Um, the complexity of the project is the second reason. Uh, there are the type of labs that are in there we are not able to move during the construction process, including a working foundry with the metal casting center. So we think the complexity of construction uh, would be helpful to have a construction manager at the front end of the project. And the last is schedule. Uh, with the funds being appropriated over a four year window and construction probably not taking that long, uh, we think it's important that we get some of that pre-construction services in the planning stages uh, and we'll get the most value out of the project that way. We will still use a competitive selection process for construction manager at risk, um, but we'd like the option to look at that. Questions? Any questions or comments for Michael? Okay, hearing none, that will be approved by consent. Uh, is there any other business to come before this committee? Hearing none, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Milt. So are we gonna move right ahead into academic affairs or do people need a break? I would say let's charge forward. I agree. Me okay. Too. Moving on. If yeah. everybody's on, you bet. Are the provosts here that need to be here? Yeah. I brought my pet fly to the meeting, unfortunately. So we'll go ahead and start then. Our first item is the approval of the Academic Affairs Committee meeting minutes from June. Are there any changes or concerns? Seeing none, we will uh, do those by approve those by general consent. Um, the UNI program termination requests um, from UNI Provost Walpart, uh, will you present the request? I will. Thank you, Regent Bucker, and good afternoon, everyone. The Master yeah. of Arts in Education program in professional development for teachers originally was designed to fulfill the professional development needs of in-service teachers across the state of Iowa. The intent of the program was to combine new content knowledge for teachers while simultaneously upskilling them in general pedagogy and classroom teaching methods. The usefulness of the program for in-service teachers has run its course as we have developed other programs, especially at the master's level that are online. And those programs have become far more sought after to provide newer models for teachers that they're looking for. We have not had a cohort for this program in the past four years, and the last students enrolled in the program graduated over two years ago. So with no active students, we thought this was an excellent time to sunset the program. This does not have an impact on resources because faculty have already shifted their efforts to other programs that do attract students. If there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Are there any questions? No. Okay, so then if there are no objections, the Academic Affairs Committee will recommend approval of the termination of the Master of Arts in Education and Professional Development of Teachers at the University of Northern Iowa. Thank you. Our next item of business is the Iowa Lakeside Lab annual report. And we have Executive Director Mary Skopek with us today. Director Skopek, welcome. And uh, please feel free to share highlights from your report. Well, thank you very much, Regents and Provost. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Of course, 2020 was a very unusual year for all of the universities and for Iowa Lakeside Laboratory in addition 
Uh, we did try to do um, the best we could in a year of learning virtually. So we offered four of our core courses, <clears throat> excuse me, um, virtually online. And it actually provided uh, an interesting opportunity for us. Um, by doing those classes online, we were able to reach students in far flung parts of the world as well as uh, in the country. And so I think for us, uh, we are looking at the ability to maybe offer some of these courses in person, hopefully next year, uh, you know, assuming that we can get the uh, virus under control, but then to also bring in the hybrid component uh, in future so that students around the world again can participate in some of these classes uh, that are quite specialized, uh, for example, the diatom and algae class. Uh, in addition to the courses, we really focused on internships this year. Uh, we had to re-imagine um, our internships so that they were more virtual and uh, creative. And so we had a number of students doing projects around the Midwest uh, with faculty members. And those internships were largely research related, um, career oriented types of research. And, and again, those students were able to connect with partners so county conservation boards, other non-governmental entities, and able to do some really interesting research. Um, in, the, in the board report, you can see the variety of different topics that those students were doing, everything from public health to prairie ecology, um, to uh, some uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, conflict management, uh, just a number of different projects that were really, really exciting. Uh, we also did some self uh, guided inquiry. We saw a need for K-12 students to continue to connect to school, even though they were maybe working online or at home um, during the summer. And so we created the daily nature videos that were three to five minute videos uh, that gave the student or the person watching a, a prompt about a nature topic and then gave them some instruction to do some hand on um, exploration at home. And those were very, very popular. Um, in total, we did about 100 of those videos. And we've started to connect those to teachers to use um, in the future as well as uh, during the summer. We created Facebook Live videos. Uh, so on Fridays, uh, people were able to log into our Facebook Live sessions with scientists and talk about a variety of different science topics and, and do that live qu question and answer with the expert. Again, those were really, really popular and we saw teachers building some curriculum around those Facebook Fridays that we actually hope to continue into the future. Um, in total, we saw our social media reach really expand, not only to Northwest Iowa, but to the entire state. Uh, we had 36,000 unique Facebook views just from those Facebook Friday uh, videos. And, and I think that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And then some other kind of um, fun things like a creative writing laboratory, so taking sort of jumping off that notion of a video um, prompt. We had a former uh, writer in residence here at, at Lakeside, um, an MFA graduate of Iowa State University, um, created this creative writing laboratory that gives uh, anybody a prompt about um, thinking about nature and writing and working through the pandemic. And we've seen a really good response to people thinking about creative writing in this time of kind of social, social isolation and pandemic. Uh, as I indicated, we had really robust student research. We, we also created a new program called the Scientist in Residence. Uh, we had some donors who were interested in some local issues, um, largely recreation issues in the Iowa Great Lakes, and they provided funding for a postdoc position, uh, which just recently started. And we're looking at boat densities in the Iowa Great Lakes and how people feel about different uh, aspects of recreation. And we're really excited about this project and think that it's gonna give the community um, some really great information to have some discussion about recreation in this really valuable um, tourist area. And then lastly, again, we just really continue our community technical outreach, uh, working with a number of partners, whether it's DNR, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, the Clean Water Commission, um, we're studying a wetland restoration, a special type of, of wetland uh, that's called a fen it, near Esterville. Um, it's the first of a kind restoration and, and we're looking at trying to assess the success of that restoration. And, and that's a really interesting, exciting project for us. Uh, and then of course, we've got a second water quality research buoy now in Big Spirit Lake to be coupled with the West Okaboji buoy, uh, providing real-time water quality information every 15 minutes from the top of the lake to the bottom of the lake, 
Uh, and again, we're seeing researchers from around the world access that data because it's highly unusual to have that level of, of information coming from lakes that are so close uh, in proximity. And then working on our, our citizen science as well, uh, going on 22 years of citizens collecting water quality data in the Iowa Great Lakes. Uh, and we've continued to do that. We had to change protocols, of course, to make it safe this year. So it was all contactless um, delivery of those samples. Um, but we, again, keep that really robust data set going. Uh, financially, you know, we, we actually ended up with a little bit of a surplus at the end of the year, which is, which is good. We're working on, um, again, you heard a lot about deferred maintenance. Um, some of you just recently um, in the last meeting, and we're working on our deferred maintenance as well. I'm trying to upgrade the stone labs, the dining hall, um, buildings that, that really need some work. And so the surplus that we have will be put toward that because these buildings are quite um, special and vulnerable to the elements if we don't um, take care of them. So I know that was a quick rundown. Hopefully you've all got the board report, um, but I'm happy to take any questions from, from the provost or regents. Um. It's always exciting to hear the fun things that you're doing there and very innovative. And I congratulate you on doing such a good job in the situation we found ourselves in this year, Thank but you. maximizing that. Are there other questions or comments? Just quick, um, it's great to see you again. Um, uh, thanks for being here. Um, you know, uh, you're doing a lot. It's great that you're doing so many things online, but I wonder if you could just say briefly what you're losing um, and, uh, and, and maybe whether, why you can't go 100% uh, online. That might be obvious to us, but might not be to people who are not as familiar with your program. Sure, so you know the, the, the purpose of Lakeside is the study of nature and nature. So hands-on, immersive, science education, uh, just education in general. And so we really want students to be in the field understanding um, that kind of hands-on component. And when you're not able to be outside collecting those samples, collecting those um, observations, you really lose sort of the overarching view of, of science, I think. <clears throat> um, we become very reductionist in society. And the thing that Lakeside, I think, brings back is this holistic view of the interconnectedness between, say, the biology, the chemistry, the, the climate, all these things, um, policy even, the, the humans that are in the environment, all of that really happened simultaneously at Lakeside. And so you're right. I mean, the online thing was a must this year, but we don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose that exploration and that inquiry that is really essential to Lakeside. And that's why the videos really came about is we would be on Lakeside campus showing people um, perhaps a, a wetland plant or a prairie plant, but then encouraging people to go in their own backyard or their own local resource and, and do the same kinds of activities. So it was not here, but we were encouraging them to do it there. But we, we really believe in that hands-on education. Great, well said, thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for the work you're doing there. Appreciate your report. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the uh, annual accreditation report. And I believe, Jason, are you going to do that? I am, yes. Thank you, Richard Budkar. Thank you. The report, the report is as submitted, but I just wanted to highlight a few points that all programs uh, receive full initial or continuing accreditation and all are meeting the expectations of their accreditors. Thank you. That's great. Are, are we going to have any slides or not? Uh, no, um, no, if you just any, the, no, not yeah. any slides, just, just the report as presented, but I, okay. if you had any questions, you could direct those to the provost regarding any of the accreditation areas. Well, we don't want to just take that for granted because that is good news. Um, and does anybody have any questions or comments concerning that? Okay, we will forward that to the full board then. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before the committee? Seeing none, we'll adjourn and get us back on time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you.
Yeah. It's
It's uh, three o'clock now. Uh, so uh, welcome to the uh, Investment and Finance Committee meeting. Uh, and I will uh, call this meeting to order. Uh, are there uh, first item on the agenda or the uh, minutes of our June 4th uh, committee meeting? Are there any questions or edits uh, that need to be made to the minutes? Hearing none, uh, committee will consider them approved by general consent. Agenda item number two is the investment and cash management report for the quarter ended June 30th, 2020. And I'd like to recommend uh, recognize uh, the Marquette uh, Managing Partners, uh, Dave Smith and Doug West for their presentation. Thank you, Regent Barker. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure everyone on this call and in this meeting is well aware of what a wild year 2020 has been. Uh, and we illustrate some of those points. We make some interesting observations and then we tie that back into the portfolio. And obviously what we are looking at here today is as of June 30, uh, which was in fact one of the best quarters in I think 25 years or so. And August was one of the best months of August in the last 30 years. So we've seen tremendous Jeez. appreciation in equity markets since the, since the printing of this report as of June 30. So while we've seen healthy recovery from the depths of March lows, that recovery, at least in equity markets, is carried forward until August 31st. So just keep that in mind. What we're looking at is slightly dated and the, and the performance is even more positive than what we're looking at here. So I'll start with on the following page or the following two pages, just an overview of economic views. And again, this is as of 6.30, the second quarter 2Q was the largest contraction uh, in, in GDP or economic growth, at least in recent history, the economy contracted by almost 33%, which is not surprising given the, given the forced shutdown over the course of the second quarter. Um, 33, that's, that's, an, that's an annualized rate, correct? Yes, sir. That's year over year. So correct. GDP did not contract by 33%. It was it contracted by 11 and annualized rate is 33. Yes, it, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good point. Not nearly as pessimistic as I made it out to be. <laughs> it is obviously emblematic of just how, how sharp and how significant that slowdown actually was. But the, fortunately, the future is much more optimistic. The forecast for 4Q, the, for, the forecast for 3Q, the forecast for 4Q suggests that there is some reopening in the economy. The Fed has made it very clear that they will keep interest rates low for an extended period of time. And we continue to see improvements in unemployment, although that seems to have stalled just a little bit. Uh, on the following page, page four, probably the biggest driver of capital market preservation, capital or return to a risk on environment is the amount of buying that the Federal Reserve accumulated in their balance sheet. The Federal Reserve stepped in in a significant way in 2008 with their quantitative easing program to backstop or support fallout from the global financial crisis as evidenced by this significant step up. Around 2008, some of those bonds started to mature uh, after the global financial crisis, and we see a very large spike within the Fed balance sheet that now represents almost 30% of GDP. But without this initiative, Without this bond buying program, financial stimulus, money markets, or money, uh, monetary stimulus, we probably would not have seen the abrupt rise, the sharp rise in equity markets. This is an important point to illustrate. While this is interesting, an interesting observation and leads to thoughts going forward, it certainly was helpful in, in rejuvenating the U.S. equity market and equity markets worldwide. Following page, page five illustration of fixed income performance. Fixed income, of course, serves as a, as a portfolio ballast when equity markets sell off. U.S. Treasuries were really the only safe haven during the, uh, during the stock market contraction. Even corporate bonds, high-quality investment-grade corporate credit didn't offer the same level of protection that investment bonds did. And we're looking at highlighted at the very top, broad market index or the Bloomberg Barclays cap or aggregate bond index, which did offer some sort of protection year to date. Uh, investors flocked to the relative safety of bonds as they pulled away from equities. 
and this was the safety net in the portfolio. Now, fast forward through August, we've seen some negative returns in, in fixed income as investors have pulled away from the relative safety and reallocated into more attractive asset classes with higher expected returns, namely equities. Uh, also worth pointing out are high yield bonds and levered loans. These are asset classes that offer higher yield over time, but certainly perform or perform like equities during periods of economic sell-off. The following page, page six, illustrates the, the interest rate environment under which we currently operate. At the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, the Federal Reserve had increased interest rates nine times from December 2015 and we were resuming a normalized interest rate environment, a slightly upward, uh, upward sh shaped yield curve, higher short-term interest rates of around two and a half percent. The Fed lowered rates three times in 2019 and then brought those basically all the way back down to zero as a way to rejuvenate uh, equity markets in, in February and March. So we expect to operate in a very short or very low interest rate environment for the foreseeable future. The guidance from the Fed suggests as, as, as far as 2023 or until we see uh, inflation near two or employment uh, revert back to normalized levels around three, three and a half percent or so. The implication here is very low expected return for fixed income. The ballast of the portfolio, low expected return. Regent Barker, question? No, go ahead. Okay. Following page, page seven, an illustration of equity market returns. The second quarter in 2020 was the best quarter since 1998. Uh, we've recovered even more in August. This was the best August in over 30 years. And so we see very healthy 2Q returns, still negative year to date in most equity market indices through June. However, through August year to date, uh, at least the S&P 500 was up close to 10%. So very significant progress forward in equity markets is a result of monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus from central banks worldwide. Page eight illustrates the magnitude of the recovery uh, with the exception of recovery in 1982. Um, the recovery so far has been one of the highest, um, or actually it is the highest and even, even more pronounced than where we are now. I think at one point by late August, early September, U.S. equity is measured by the S&P 500 had recovered almost 50% from market trough. So we've seen a significant swing upwards, which obviously helps growth portions of portfolios buoyed by, buoyed by equity, public equity. And then just an interesting observation on slide nine, most people recognize or, or see just how significant tech sector um, has really been impacted by, by the COVID crisis from work from home, uh, shopping from home. And it's no surprise that Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, referred to as the FANG stocks uh, are up almost 25% representing almost 22% of the overall capitalization of the S&P 500. By contrast, the bottom 495 stocks are still in negative territory. So what the, the returns, while positive and while exciting, really have just been driven by a handful of names. I'll pause there and turn it over to Doug. On page 10, we get into the non-US equity markets and you know, the, there was a nice solid bounce back again from the trough of March 23rd, uh, really led by emerging markets. But despite that large bounce back, you can see that non-US secondary returns have still trailed the US, uh, both this year and over the last several years. And just to call back to Dave's last slide, really a large part of that is the lower tech exposure and higher cyclical exposure that you see overseas. If you move forward to page 11, we turn to real estate and, uh, you know, Dave mentioned that treasuries were one of the few areas that were positive in the first quarter. Real estate was actually one of the other areas that was positive. Uh, the second quarter, you finally saw the impact of the shutdowns really felt in performance, uh, particularly in the retail sector, uh, which was really one of the one areas that was most impacted by the shutdowns. Uh, but real estate as a whole for the quarter was down around 1.6%. Uh, so much shallower drawdown than what you've seen in the public equity markets. But uh, you know, the, the fact remains that the shutdowns have impacted uh, performance as a whole in real estate. 
Uh, it's worth noting that industrial has been one of the areas of the, the real estate market that's seen one of the biggest tailwinds uh, so far this year. And it's been one of the strongest sectors over, over the last several years with the rise of e-commerce. And on page 12, if you move forward one slide, it's also worth noting that those areas, things like retail, hotels that were really impacted by COVID-19 and the shutdowns uh, represent a very small portion of the overall index as a whole. Uh, so again, uh, while retail has been uh, certainly in the news a lot and, and certainly impacted, uh, at this point, it's now around 15% of the overall index. On page 13, if you move forward one slide, uh, you know, over the past 20 years, private equity has materially outperformed the, the public markets. And uh, you know, the, the, the takeaway here in the first quarter is that private equity will not be immune to the shutdowns. It will not be immune to the impact of the crises, but it's held up much better than public markets. Uh, and, and if you flip forward to the next slide, you know, it, it still remains to be seen how this economic downturn will play out. But in the past, uh, here we're profiling the dot-com crisis and the, the global financial crisis. Uh, private equity has held up much better during the, the downturn and it's uh, much quicker to recover on the upturn. Uh, so overall, private equity has weathered market downturns very well over the last few cycles. Uh, again, uh, during the first quarter, the performance was roughly half of that of, of what you saw out of the public equity market. So it did protect uh, slightly on the downturn and uh, again, remains to be seen how, how quickly the, the market rebounds uh, you know, post this. But uh, again, in the past, it's, it's weathered pullbacks pretty well. And on the 15 is the, the last slide of the market environment. And just to point out the asset class returns, again, as, as David mentioned, really the, the second quarter was a real strong bounce back quarter for risk assets. But if you look at the year to date returns, you can see that uh, fixed income is still the best performing asset class here through the second quarter. And you can see to the far right, uh, equity markets still in the negative territory. If we move this forward, July and August were very strong months for the equity markets. And through August, you know, as Dave mentioned, broad equity market was up around 10%. Uh, that is a, a higher level than where the fixed income markets were at that point. So this chart was definitely shifted in the last two months. Uh, but again, through the, the quarter, fixed income was still the leading asset class year to date. Doug, is something to take from this slide that it's non-tech equity that's really performed the, the, the worst? Yeah, from a, from a deviation standpoint, smaller cap, uh, non-US, non-tech equity has certainly been the laggards uh, this year. Right, because that small cap index does not have a lot of tech and the foreign does not have. Correct. I, okay. Any other questions on the market environment before uh, Dave moves on to the portfolios? Uh, anyone else with questions? I, I want, so, you, you know, you mentioned the Fed at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I think the only downside to that Fed buying is inflation risk. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we're seeing any uh, inflation risk uh, uh, at this time. Is that a fair? Uh, yes, sir. That that is a that is a fair statement. We we didn't see any sort of inflationary pressures or real inflationary pressures following the global financial crisis and the stimulus that came with that. Uh, with levels of unemployment as as high as they are, it's unlikely that we would see inflationary pressures. And then things like energy consumption, uh, materials, and other cyclicals that typically drive inflationary pressures those are still relatively stressed as a result of this, of this recent round of sell-off. Uh, we would be very surprised if we saw inflationary pressures mount anytime over the next, next two years. Right, so that chart you have on Fed buying, it, it, it looks scary, I think, to a lot of people, but, but we shouldn't take it that way. It's, it's scary in a sense that it's unusual and it's something to keep our eye on when we think about capital markets, but that historically has not led to inflationary pressures. Right, so they seem to be doing the right thing. Without a doubt, had they not stepped in, I think we would be under more significant stress than we are now. Good, thank you. So, so as we transition to the portfolio on I think 17, and we think about the backdrop of the economic environment and we think about the operating portfolios, we, we just saw on the very last slide that fixed income whether it was short-term global bonds, core bonds, 
offered the most support along with some real estate, offered the most support over the backdrop of, of equity sell-off. The operating portfolios are very defensive. They have a lower goal return than the endowments. The return objective with the operating portfolios are somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 4%. And they are designed to support frequent and perhaps large cash outflows. We don't want to see a lot of volatility. So as evidenced by this slide, the allocation within the operating portfolio tends to favor fixed income, 60% by goal, just over that in terms of an actual amount at the end of the quarter. We, stri we try to stay as close to these goals as possible. Small equity allocation, roughly 10% across U.S. and non-U.S. equity, a managed volatility strategy that helps ma uh, manage or mitigate volatility during periods of stress, real estate, and then some liquidity. All of that leads to, on the next slide, please, uh, surprisingly healthy results given the magnitude of the equity market sell-off over the quarter up 4.7% over the trailing one-year period uh, for the period ending 630 in positive territory, slightly underperforming the benchmark, which is somewhat attributable to uh, investment grade core fixed income or investment grade fixed income uh, and core plus sectors selling off slightly but recovering following the end of the second quarter. And over a five year period, which is really the most important mark, how well we're doing over the long term, we're almost even with the benchmark at 3.6% very closely aligned with our overall goal allocation. And the message on this page, consistent with the message on all of the other pages, abiding by the policy, abiding by the goal allocations, allows us to recover quickly as equity markets recover. We resisted the urge to sell equities, we maintained our allocation, and we were rewarded for it across every single portfolio. Next slide, please. So Iowa State University operating portfolios, and again, just as a reminder, each of the universities have identical goal allocations. There may be some variability with respect to the actual amount as cash flows may differ from period to period, but the message here is the same. 60% goal weight allocation to fixed income, very large amounts of protection in this portfolio was rewarded as well on 20, uh, maybe slightly higher performance over the quarter in over a five-year period uh, on, on slide 20, please. And again, results that are very consistent with what we just observed with the University of Iowa. Impressive one-year numbers given what happened with equity markets and a five-year number of 3.7% that's identical to the benchmark, identical to the policy and consistent with our overall goal, goal rate of return. <laughs> Slide 21, please. So the University of Iowa is, is, the only, is the one institution that has a diversified intermediate portfolio slightly more risk, slightly higher return objective, slightly higher allocations to equity, 20% across U.S. and non-U.S. equity. And what that leads to over time is a higher expected return, a higher actual return, but it offers a little bit more volatility during periods of equity market sell-off. Still have a high allocation to fixed income, but less allocated to liquidity. So as evidenced on the next page, uh, we see a very strong quarter as equity markets recover but slightly lower uh, trailing one year return for the period ending 630. But over a five year period, we're very consistent with the, with the policy benchmark return. And we are slightly ahead of our goal return expectation of 4%, uh, eclipsing that by about uh, 20 basis points, returning 4.2% for the five year period. The endowment portfolio uh, on slide 23, please. So the endowment across both portfolios for the University of Iowa, Iowa State, and of course, University of Northern Iowa is invested in the University of Iowa endowment portfolio as well. The objective is long-term results, long-term growth, being able to grow assets to align with longer-term obligations. We have a much higher allocation to public equities, a much higher allocation to private markets, in a lower allocation to fixed income and liquidity. The idea here is to grow the portfolio, and we do that through a mix of public and private markets. We also offer some diversification through real estate and through, through fixed income. So on the next slide, uh, over the quarter, this is the best performer of the three. As equity markets recovered, we see very healthy returns in, in the second quarter of almost 9%, but probably not much of a surprise over the trailing 12-month period 
that we saw some dislocation as a result of the higher allocation to equities. Not a surprise, not a concern, because when we look over a five-year period, we are very consistent with our overall expectations, outperforming the, the policy benchmark and returning around 6.1%. If we look over a longer term time horizon, the performance is even better than that. But the objection or the objective is higher risk, higher return expectation. And then finally on, on 25, uh, the same is true for, univer or for Iowa State University. We still have high allocations to public market, to public equities, to private equities <coughs> with a smaller allocation to fixed income. And again, that's led to very favorable results as illustrated on slide 26, um, up 8.5% for the quarter, down slightly for the year, uh, 50 basis points. But again, over a five-year period, we are outpacing our policy benchmark and aligned with our longer-term uh, longer term goals. So again, just to reiterate, maintaining the discipline set forward in our asset allocation, being consistent with what we think will drive results over the long term, uh, we were rewarded by that through the quick snapback in public markets. You know, we'll, we'll pause here to take any questions. It's, it's worth noting that this time every year we, we uh, review a peer comparison to just evaluate how well these institutions are performing relative to a peer of other uh, academic institutions. But we'll pause here and take questions about the portfolio. Any, any questions from anyone? Uh, in a volatile environment like this, it must be a little more challenging to maintain those uh, asset allocations. Is that right? Uh, it, it is, but we we typically use cash flows and rebalance when needed. Uh, and then the, the the swiftness and the magnitude of that snapback was certainly helpful. Uh, equity markets sold off, I think, in something like 19 trading days. They hit a trough on March 23rd. Have been going pretty much one direction since then, but keeping an eye on uh, overall market values with respect to two policies is, is something where we spend a lot of time make sure, making sure that we're maintaining those goal weights. And to be clear, what we mean on that, when equity markets dropped to maintain those asset allocations, we were out there buying equity. Either, either buying equity or sourcing outflows from fixed income. Uh, in other words, we're, we were not obligated to sell equities when equities deteriorate. Right, right. And in fact, yeah, we're, we're adding more because they dropped to keep that same asset allocation. And so we benefited from the snapback. Exactly. Thank you. Well, if there's no other questions on this, if we could move to the peer review. Yes, and on that, uh, the peer review, we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, and uh, boy, if you could emphasize, uh, I mean, I think we look very good here, and if you could emphasize the uh, fact that our risk-adjusted returns compare even more favorably uh, to other institutions uh, than just looking at the unadjusted returns. Absolutely. And so, again, each year we perform this peer analysis for the endowments, and again, here we're looking at two different peer groups. I think everyone is well aware of Nakubo. Uh, in the studies that they put out. Uh, so we're comparing the asset allocation and performance to Nakubo peer groups, uh, and then also a peer group from investment metrics, uh, which is a, a large uh, universe of, of data. It's about uh, now I think over $10 trillion in assets in this uh, universe. So uh, we've compared to both because Nakubo tends to be a little bit on a delay. Uh, and so the, the first section here on page three uh, we're showing the University of Iowa asset allocation, which is shown in blue, against the different peer groups. Uh, again, there's a lot, of, a lot of lines on this page, but I think two takeaways here. One, we're not attempting to mimic any other peer group's asset allocation, but I think it is instructive just to see where peers are allocating capital and to understand any differences that we might have. And so that if you look at the endowments asset allocation, you'll notice some differences relative to the different peer groups. Uh, namely a slightly higher allocation of fixed income, which uh, to Regent Barker's point has, has certainly had an impact on uh, the risk of the portfolio and, and lowering that relative to, to peer groups. But overall, it's pretty close to the peers in most areas. And if you move to the next slide on page four, uh, the same thing uh, for the Iowa State endowment here. And again, there are some differences depending on which peer group you're looking at, but again, the overall picture is, is fairly similar to the, the different peer groups uh, that we show. Moving to page five, here we're looking at performance. 
the blue on this page, again, is representative of the University of Iowa endowment performance. And we're looking at this relative to the most recent Nakubo performance peer groups. Uh, this data, again, as I mentioned, will always be on a little bit of a lag due to Nakubo's release dates. Uh, but here in the orange, we're comparing against peer uh, academic institutions between 250 and 500 million. And then the, the black dots on the page, the square, triangle, and diamond, those are representing the entire universe of Nakubo uh, and the median and top and bottom quartile performers. And so if you look at the slide, you'll see that not only is the blue line above the peer groups, it's also above the top quartile in most instances of the entire Nakubo universe. Uh, to put it another way, the University of Iowa's endowment is outperforming all the peer groups, and it's also at or ahead the top performing endowments in the country over the long term. And again, as Regent Barker noted, it's doing this at a lower risk uh, level as well. And if you move to the next slide on page six, here we look at the Iowa State endowment. And again, uh, if you look over the long term, uh, not only is it outperforming its peer group, uh, again, in the orange there, but also outperforming uh, the top quartile of the entire uh, Nakubo peer group. And then moving to page seven, we show the investment metrics. Uh, here, this is as of June 30, 2020. Uh, the one caveat or point worth noting here is that uh, the private markets allocation is not valued yet as of June 30. So, uh, you know, at this point, looking at the near-term performance might not be as instructive, uh, just given the, the performance timing differences. Uh, but if, again, if you look over the long term, you'll, you'll see that the endowment is, again, ranking very highly relative to this peer group, uh, you know, over the longer term, ranking, ranking in the top decile uh, of, of similar academic institutions. And over page eight, uh, again, similar story here for the Iowa State Endowment. Uh, again, over the, the long-term periods and, and shorter-term periods, the endowments outperform the peer group as well. So I think that the takeaway for the peer analysis is that the asset allocation does have some differences, but is, is widely in line with, with what peers are doing. Uh, and from a performance perspective, long-term performance and short-term performance has done very well relative to uh, both peer groups. And I'll stop there unless there's any other questions. That's the, all we had for the peer analysis part of the presentation. Uh, any questions from anyone? I don't have any questions, but yep. um, I just want to add that Doug and Dave, I really want to thank you for the presentation because your confidence and uh, your educated presentation helps me sleep better at night for sure. <laughs> and if I could talk to you about trying to get a 2% interest rate at a local bank here. Well, maybe I'll, I'll call you about that later, but. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Dunkel. That's, that's why we're here. Uh, <laughs> we stay up late so you don't have to. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? If not, the Investment and Finance Committee is now adjourned. Thanks, David. Thank, Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I think, are we done? I think we're done.